Make your preparation a stepping stone to the higher rungs of the final selection list. Test and equip yourself before the final personality test. With the Vision IS Personality Development Program for Civil Services Examination 2023. With takeaways such as DF analysis session with senior experts and faculty members. Mock interview session with ex-bureaucrats educationists. Interaction with toppers and serving bureaucrats. Performance evaluation and feedback. At Vision IS, we aim to empower you with guidance for the questions ranging from your interests, current affairs, general knowledge, aptitude to critical thinking, which are instrumental in determining your path ahead. Admissions are open now. EUPSC CSE Arena is an ever-evolving space where staying up to date becomes as crucial as maintaining a thorough preparation with strategic planning and holistic coverage for exam syllabus vision is delhi presents the gs foundation course 2025 2026 and 2027 avail analysis and integration of current affairs with the gs syllabus all India test series with an innovative assessment system, inculcating post-test analysis, discussion, all India ranking, and more. Explore the holistic learning modules, intrinsically designed for the ideal aspirant. Batch starts 20th December, 5 p.m. Offline come live online classes. Start strong with a solid foundation. Enroll today in the Vision ISGS Foundation course 2025, 2026 and 2027.
Hello and good afternoon, dear students. Welcome to this enlightening personality development session. Well, when you will make your name in the UPSC final list of qualified students, there will be huge external applause. Everyone will be showering praises on you. But what about now? What about this stage when no one is applauding for you when you need the encouragement and the strength the most? I get reminded of a line, cheer for yourself even when no one is cheering for you. Pat your own back for small wins because the applause you give yourself today sets the stage for even bigger achievements tomorrow. For, with me, clap for yourself for clearing UPSC Mains 2023. It is with great pleasure and honor that I welcome our esteemed speaker today, respected Sri Mohan sir, Sri Krishna Mohan sir, a person of profound knowledge and experience. Sir brings a wealth of expertise that promises to enlighten and inspire you all. With over 36 years of extensive experience in Indian administrative services, Sri Krishna Mohan sir has demonstrated expertise across diverse sectors like rural and urban development, infrastructure, health, education, and more. Holding key roles in Haryana and Chandigarh, he served as head of department and administrative secretary, certified as national trainer on ethics. He's part of national pool of trainers appointed by DOPT and United Nations Development Program. Additionally, Shri Krishna Mohan sir is a recognized national trainer on e-governance certified by NEGD, specializing in government process, re-engineering, e-governance procurement, and change management. Sir is also mentoring students of I am Vishakhapatnam and I am Nagpur. Well, let's welcome sir on stage. Hello, sir. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So afternoon sessions are very challenging sessions. That is why they are called graveyard sessions. Because in the graveyard, everyone is sleeping. And particularly after a good meal, which you have had, your Madhya Pradesh is full. This is the Madhya Pradesh, your stomach. And when the Madhya Pradesh is full, the Uttar Pradesh goes to sleep. So that is what happens in the afternoons. But then life goes on in the afternoon also. And therefore, we shall be talking about a subject uh, which will be useful not only in the interviews, but also in the mains examination. So those of you who have already qualified the mains and are uh, uh, waiting eagerly for uh, you to uh, ultimately appear at the personality test, uh, and those who of you who are ultimately appearing for uh, the prelims and the mains. So I would like to extend my best wishes for your success. At the same time, I would like to thank Ruchi for uh, having said so many complimentary words about me. Well, I really richly don't deserve them, but uh, she is otherwise such a uh, good speaker and communicator, and she is in a position to establish a good relationship with the participants. So thank you so much, Ruchi, for everything you have said. Uh, so, today I'm going to talk about basically three things which are related to the GS4 paper. Now, GS4 paper uh, talks about ethics, integrity, and aptitude. And uh, ethics, there are many branches of ethics. All of you must have read it. So, one of them is applied ethics. So, applied ethics talks about uh, uh, things like uh, abortion, talks about environmental ethics, it talks about euthanasia. It talks about uh, issues concerning AI and military ethics and uh, just war and so on. So there are so many topics under the applied ethics. And applied ethics uh, deal with such a branch of ethics where one group of people, uh, there is another group of people which is against that. So some are in favor, some are against. For example, euthanasia or abortion. So some people are in favor of that, some people are against that. So similarly, issues concerning artificial intelligence, or for that matter, war, or for that matter, social media, uh, you know, people who are promoters, and uh, such people. So therefore, there are two schools of thought everywhere. Ethics actually depends on the context, situation, and the need of the hour. Now, when we talk about ethics, 
I will come straight away to the three branches, but before that, let me set the context. So, all of you have heard the name of Shiva Khela. So, Shiva Khela, who is he? Motivational speaker, writer, author. So, Shiva Khela once went to Singapore. And when he got down from the plane, he hired a taxi. The name of the taxi driver was Henry. And he told Henry, to take him to a particular place in Singapore. Now Henry was a very old driver, but he did not know the exact location of this particular office where Shivikela wanted to go. So on the way they started talking about India and Singapore. And when the taxi came near a group of multi-storied buildings where Henry presumed that that office was situated, even then, since he did not know the exact location, he had to take many extra rounds of those multi-storied buildings before he could pinpoint that particular office. And when that particular office was sighted, he stopped the vehicle. At that point of time, the taxi meter reading showed $11. So Shiv Khela got down and uh, he started paying $11. And uh, Henry said, no sir, $10. He said, but your meter is showing $11. He said, sir, I'm a taxi driver. And I'm expected to know each and every location in the city. That's my job. And believe me, sir, if I had come straight away to this particular office, it would have actually cost you just $10. Because of my ignorance, you cannot be faulted. And if I charge you $11, I would be committing one of the most unethical acts on this earth. And that too before a foreigner. You represent India, I represent Singapore. I may not be holding a diplomatic passport on behalf of the government of Singapore and yet I represent my country and therefore I would not like to be proved unethical before an Indian. Shiv Khela was amazed and when he came back to India, he narrated this incident far and wide in all his speeches and he said that that taxi driver had a firm belief, conviction and principle inside him which did not allow him to be unethical before me. Now this belief, principle, conviction which is present in every one of you is called as a value. Hindi mein kahe jivan mulya. So this value which was present in that driver, what was the name of that value? Honesty, honesty. So honesty, integrity, patriotism, these were the values. And the values, there are hundreds of values in the society. Some are typically required for civil servants. So what are those values which are generally required for all of us, particularly civil servants? Accountability, transparency, compassion, leadership, non-partisanship, absolutely correct. So these are uh, the values. So truthfulness, non-violence, honesty, integrity, accountability, Positivity, discipline, diligence, compassion, empathy, sympathy. So these are the values. Now let us understand the difference between a value and ethics. When these values are in action in this world, only then they become ethics. So the value will remain a value only unless human beings use that value while dealing with other stakeholders in the society, that is other human beings. Human conduct is necessary. If that taxi driver had kept the principle of honesty inside him, he would not have used it vis-a-vis -vis Shiva Khela. It would not become ethics. So ethics means values in action in the world or the play of values in this world. So therefore, ethics is the ultimate result. The cause is the value. Effect is the ethics. If there is a tree, the, the roots of the tree are the values and the tree, the branches, etc., they are the ethics. So, this is the relation between values and ethics. Why ethics is contextual? You see, all these things which you are going to talk about, they will say that ethics is contextual. Why ethics is contextual? Because ethics is not coded, it is not in black and white. Other things may be uh, legal things, they are in black and white, but ethics is not coded. It is not in black and white. Something may be ethical in one situation, may be unethical in another situation. Something may be unethical in some situation, may be ethical in another situation. For example, 
a patient goes to a doctor and he is suffering from cancer and doctor after examining him says thinks that this is not going to survive more than 3 months but will he tell him that you will pop off in 3 months time you will die in 3 months time he will not say that he will say no no you will be fine you take these medicine he is telling a lie telling a lie is unethical but in this case telling the lie would become ethical because he would be able to put that patient at peace so therefore the results are sometimes very important take another example there is a murderer who is chasing your friend and that friend comes and hides inside your house and now the murderer comes and he says is that fellow inside your house what will you say yes he is there come please inside he will you will not say that you will say i don't know he is not there you are telling a lie but here the lie would again be ethical so ordinarily lying is unethical but in this context lying will become ethical so this is why ethics is always contextual and therefore we have to examine each case things case by case that is why in the ethics paper you have two parts one is the theory part the other is the case studies and case studies deal with the ethical dilemmas which all of you will face once you become civil servants sometimes your superior will give you a wrong order what will you do you will be in an ethical dilemma sometimes there will be a peaceful group of farmers will be sitting on the road and your superior will say oh order a lati charge and you will feel why should i order a lati charge they are sitting peacefully so you will be in an ethical dilemma so with that context ethics uh, i am going to start off with this but before that i am going to talk about just one thing generally people believe that ethics means honesty and integrity it is not so ethics in the context of a civil servant means efficiency effectiveness performance delivery contributing to the productivity there can be many public servant who may be very honest zindagi bhar honest rehte hain par ek file bhi nahi nikalte hain such people are highly unethical people i have seen many people who at the time of retirement they will get up and give their farewell speech and they will say i have remained honest throughout my life what's the point of being honest if you have not taken a decision you know such people are called as tread millers you know what is a tread mill all of you must be hitting the gym every day so the tread mill is a machine on which you start running after 20 minutes of running how many inches do you actually move not even a single inch it is a stationary running okay so many of the civil servants they become tread millers and they don't dispose of the dark they don't take decision they sit on the files they are highly inefficient they are highly ineffective so never be a tread miller you must perform you must deliver and this is what narendra modi also says that you have to ultimately deliver because you are getting salary from the public exchequer and public exchequer gets the through the taxes the money from the public so we are responsible to the citizens of this country so with that thing let me start off the three topics of the day so first of we'll talk about three things artificial intelligence number 1 war and number 3 the social media okay now everything uh, comes along with this something positive something negative atomic energy also brings something positive something negative you remember the nobel prize was named after which scientist alfred nobel what did he manufacture or what did he discover dynamite now dynamite can be used in both the purposes it can be used for yeah for carrying out developmental activities as well as it can be used for purposes which may be detrimental to the human race so therefore everything comes uh, with the two sides so the artificial intelligence war as well as social media is a double edged weapon and yesterday also when i was talking to uh, some of you i'm sure some of you were present there i was telling you that in the interview and the personality test never come up with a an idea which gives an impression to the panel that you are having very very fixed ideas you have to have rationality 
you have to give both the sides of the coin so that the person can feel that when you will become a civil servant you will be able to be amenable to different ideas different viewpoints that is called as rationality objectivity you should be able to analyze you should be able to solve the problems by trying to find out what are the different options available so that is called as problem solving and decision making so therefore here also when we talk about these three things there are ethics so ethics is what ought to be done and what ought not to be done that is ethics okay so let's talk about ethics of social media influencers so there are many people who are social media influencers so influencers have become key tools in the marketing world you know there is something called as crm what is crm what is crm which has become very popular very essential for any company what is crm customer relationships management it is practiced by practically every company whether it's mcdonald whether it is uh, uh, pizza world or any other company or the 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 car companies every company has got customer relationship management now there, there are uh, tools available how to relate to the customer and that talks about how to retain the old customers and how to add new customers okay so basically influencers are meant to increase the customer base popularize something build up the brand so influencers have become key tools in the marketing world capable of shaping public opinion so these are the people who have got lot of following lot of popularity and when they say something sachin tendulkar says something amitabh bachchan says something or any other celebrity says something people tend to believe that and that is exactly the role being played by the social media influencers so they influence purchasing decisions and even changing behavior of their followers so however this power of influencer has consequences and carries ethical responsibility also so everything has a good and a bad side so here we will explain the different aspects of the brands and influencers need to reconsider in order to create ethical uh, decision making transparent and authentic now kindly see transparenting and authentic these are the two values so everything which we are going to talk about today is related to the values i told you that values in action become ethics so in the case of war in the case of social media influencers or in the case of artificial intelligence we need to work on the values which are required only then we will make lead to a better world otherwise it will lead to lot of chaos disorder and pandemonium like narendra modi recently talked about deep fakes okay and he was very concerned about it and he is one prime minister who has actually shown to the world what digital india can look like and he came out with that equation it is equal to it plus it what was that equation can anyone tell me it is equal to it plus it what is the full form it is equal to it plus it so narendra modi says it on the left side is india's tomorrow on the right side the first it is information technology and the second it is what is that yeah yes india yeah so it is basically the the youth of india he is trying to concentrate on that okay so it is equal to it plus it so basically what we are trying to say is that the 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 impetus is has been given to the it the digital india the artificial intelligence the technology by the prime minister and that is why the prime minister took the uh, the initiative in g20 also in talking about this thing in also recently concluded 3 days conference which was inaugurated by the prime minister and which is going to be followed up in near future uh, in 2024 by a group of nations coming together on that particular topic so key ethical issues in influencer marketing let's talk about some of the key ethical issues ethics and social responsibility in influencer marketing refers to what are the values transparency number 1 honesty 
authenticity in promoting products considering the impact on the audience and society can you tell me one example where authenticity has become so important nowadays because people uh, talk about certain products and without even using those products they propagate them that is why authenticity is so important can you name two industries at least two products where this promotional thing is done by many people and people believe that it is true koi example yeah okay pan masala health hazard news met yeah absolutely cosmetic industry medicinal product soft drinks and then what about certain lotions which they say it can grow hair that is something which is you know ki isse aapke baal aa jayenge you see so they are that you know that kind of thing or losing weight so they'll say this belt if you wear it is going to burn off the fat so these are the things that you know when the celebrities use them influencers use them then people tend to believe and that is why some ethics are required to be you know enforced in respect of these people you have to have a code of conduct now how do we enforce this there are only two ways one is self discipline that is having a code of conduct and the second is regulation by the government only three ways so both the things have to be done in respect of the social media influencers some code of conduct like ott platform there is a censorship for others but ott platform till now they do not have censorship so therefore uh, they thought that probably they will have a code of conduct huh government is planning to bring about censorship also on the ott platforms so what happens is over a period of time you know things new things come new problems come did you at ever point think that there will be a problem of copying in the examination we never thought that when we studied copying was a bored one could never think of copying in the examination but then copying started ragging in the colleges it was never done but then the new problem came and similarly new issues came same sex marriage live in relationships homosexuality so with the passage of time new issues come and therefore one has to find ways and means to counter that so that the consumer is protected this is precisely what is required in the case of influencer marketing so create an ethical marketing plan it's important to select the right influencers set clear expectations and comply with regulation and be transparent with the audiences so definition of ethics and social responsibility in corporate marketing so you can you can just have a look at it in marketing ethics refers to the moral principles and values that guide the actions and decisions taken by the companies and the marketers so there are many stakeholders who are the stakeholders in the case of social marketing yes brand companies influencers followers consumers advertisement companies social media platforms yes correct and the government and the gov and the regulatory bodies ngos also so all these are the stakeholders and you know the government of the governance today is too complex a matter to be left alone to the government there are three entities which are required nowadays and the government of the day also understands that that nothing can be done by the government alone you require two other important entities one of them is the stakeholder and the other is the civil society so all the three things have to combine themselves join themselves to come out with decisions on important matters for example judiciary may have a different view about same sex marriage government have a different view so you have to bring all these people stakeholders together to come out so the same thing is required to be done here so the concept of ethical marketing inter alia avoids dishonest or manipulative practices that jeopardize the privacy or rights of the consumers similarly for example the 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 the, the creams which are there which say that uh, your your color will become absolutely uh, you know white and uh, darkish color you will be able to lose now that again is something which uh, has got uh, you know we have to take it with a pinch of salt so therefore when when some actress or some celebrity gets up and she says that 
that this is so, then you tend to believe that. And that is why uh, even a Bharat Ratna, uh, uh, Sachin Tendulkar says something, so you tend to believe that. So these people have got a lot of influence on the people. And therefore, they also have to act with certain amount of self-discipline. And that is what why it has been included in the GS4 paper. So social responsibility in marketing is the obligation of the companies to contribute to the general welfare because ultimately it is the welfare of the people. We have a system right now which is called as a citizen-centric system of governance. Unlike the system of governance which was colonial system of governance when we were a British colony. Hum log Britishers ko dekhte the. Jitne kanun bante the sab Britishers ko dhyan mein rakke bante the. Par ab 1947 ke baad jitne bhi kanun bante hain uska ek single focus hota hai that is the citizen of this country so therefore here in the case of companies the citizen becomes the consumer so citizen and consumer they are the same people and therefore whenever a companies use the influencers they must exercise the right influencers and the influencers also have a responsibility that they will not propagate or promote a product unless they have used it themselves. So, proceeding further, ethical marketing with influencers require that all of the above elements are met always striving for transparency, honesty and authenticity. Authenticity means you should be authentic. People should believe that what you are saying is correct. And you should also believe that when you are saying something, it is correct. So therefore, authenticity is in a very important quality of a leader also. Those of you who have studied leadership, there is a, the leadership approach was enunciated by Harvard Business School. If you have time, whenever you find time, go to the Google and try to type out ontological approach to leadership. Ontological approach to leadership. And you will find that the Harvard Business School talks about and it says that there are three essential things which are very necessary for a leader. One is called integrity, the other is called a bigger purpose or a higher purpose and third is called authenticity. So the leader must have integrity. Integrity is do what you say and say what you do. Walk the talk, absolutely correct. So the same thing, influencer is a leader. The leader must say what you do and do what you say. Walk the talk. Kathni or karni mein fark nahi hona chahiye. So that is integrity. And the second is called as having a bigger purpose. So the leader must have a bigger purpose. Not only the purpose, self-purpose. It should be for the organization. Gandhi ji had a bigger purpose of getting the freedom for this country. Martin Luther King had a bigger purpose for getting the justice for the blacks. Nelson Mandela had a bigger purpose for getting rid of the apartheid. Abraham Lincoln had a bigger purpose for getting abolition of the slavery. So these leaders have a bigger purpose. So the leader, second quality is that the bigger purpose must be much bigger than his own purpose. So personal agenda should not be there. There should be a bigger purpose. And third is called authenticity which I was trying to tell you. Authenticity is that the person, whatever he says, people should believe that when he says something, it must be true. And he or she must also believe that when you are saying something, you also believe that it is true. That is what is required for an influencer. Let me give you an example of authenticity. How many of you have heard the name of Charles Blondin? Charles Blondin was a great tightrope walker. So Charles Blondin was from France and he was one of the biggest tightrope walker in the world. Now you know what is the tightrope walker. You put two poles and there is a rope and you climb onto that rope and from one end to the other end you travel with the help of balancing with the help of a pole. That is called as a tightrope walker. The biggest tightrope walker in the world was from France that was Charles Blondin and he used to commit impossible feats, near impossible. He would climb onto the top of a, of a multi-storied building and he will walk to the other multi-storied buildings on a rope without any protection underneath. So one day, Charles Blondin decided that he would walk across Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, you know, is the 
one of the biggest falls in this world. It has two ends. One is called America, the other is called Canada. So he tied a rope across Niagara Falls. Now you know that anyone falling in that Niagara Falls, his body would also not be found. And he said, I'm going to walk across the Niagara Falls. And lot many people gathered to see this near impossible feat. And then he spoke on the microphone. And he said, do you think I will be able to walk across to the other side? Everyone said, yes. We believe you. You are authentic. You can do that. You can walk to the other side of Niagara Falls. And he climbed onto the rope and he walked across to the other side. Everyone clapped. And now he said, do you think I will be able to walk back the same way to the other side? Everyone said, yes. You can do that. We believe you can do that. And then he said, do you think I will be able to carry one person on my shoulder to the other side? Everyone said, yes, you can do that. You are authentic. He said, who is that man? Come forward. Come forward. There was pin drop silence. One man rose and he said, you are authentic. I believe you. I am going to go across on your shoulder to the other side. I will put my life in your hands because I believe that whatever you say is right. He said, hop onto my shoulder. And he hopped onto his shoulder and he carried him to the other side. That is called as authenticity. So the influencer must believe that what he says is true. And the people should also believe. And that is why there is a need to exercise ethics from the point of view of an influencer. Okay, so what are the eight principles of business ethics? Well, these are the values. Many of you must have already done that in GS4 paper. So one is integrity. These are the eight principles. The second is transparency. That is being honest with your audiences. So one should be transparent. Integrity means acting honestly, sincerely, while maintaining high ethical standards. Never. By the way, integrity word is derived from a term in mathematics. What is that term? Yeah, integration, integer. So being whole. Being consistent with your values, never wavering, never changing them over a period of time. Third is fairness. Fairness is again an important thing. So companies should treat all parts of their community equally and avoiding discrimination and respecting the rights of all. And respect. Show respect for diversity, human rights, cultural differences. This is the key as consumers often prefer inclusive brands. Sustainability, considering the long-term impact of business. You know, the reputation is built over a period of time. Why do we purchase uh, Tata Ka Namak? Because they have built a brand over a period of time. We will not purchase any other salt. So this is how the brand is made. And it is built slowly, you know, piece by piece. Tata is regarded as one of the most ethical corporate houses in this world. And you remember, if you have heard this, uh, this incident about J.R.D. Tata. J.R.D. Tata in his office had a table and there were two drawers in that table. Both the drawers contained stationary items. A4 sheets and pencil and rubber and eraser and scale. But there was a difference. The left drawer contained the stationary items which he had purchased from the company's account. Company's money. The right drawer contained the stationary items which he had purchased from his own savings bank account. Never did he mix the two. If it was a personal work, he would take out the stationery from the right drawer. And if it was a company's work, he would take out the stationery from the left drawer. So that was an example of integrity which he displayed. And that is how he was able to sustain the Tata group of companies over a period of time. Huh? Kotelia also do that. Absolutely correct, sir. Mm. Mm. Yeah, correct, absolutely. There was a uh, also a similar, I, I don't recall, who used to, there was no electricity at that time, he used to have candles. Uh -huh. So candles also, he would use personal candles and so on. Accountability, so taking responsibility for all. Now, one of the accountability principles which was displayed, that is taking responsibility, it is a value. 
Oh, the great accountability principle was displayed by one of the former railway ministers of this country who later on rose to become the Prime Minister, Lal Bahadur Shastri. So, Lal Bahadur Shastri displayed that accountability. So, the, the, in, the, the influencers must also take full responsibility. Tomorrow they cannot turn around. I don't know, I have only shown this. I have never used the Coca-Cola or for that matter any other product. So they have to take accountability for their actions. Again, a part of the values. Okay. And regulatory compliance. So regulatory compliance is following law. So whatever is the law of the land, you have to follow that law of the land. So brands must comply with applicable laws, regulation standards, and lastly, but social responsibility. So they must, they also have a social responsibility. Just like any corporate house has got a social responsibility, which perhaps Tata, Wipro, and Infosys, and some others, they used to do that without any government regulation, but then ultimately government had to bring in regulation to ensure that. And uh, that I'm sure all of you are aware about the CSR. So CSR is practiced now, practically every company has to do that. Okay, so characteristics of ethical and responsible influencer marketing. The characteristics of ethical marketing include the values which we have just now talked about the eight values all action between companies and influencers should be transparent and honest with the community so responsible and ethical influencers care about the well-being of their end users the audience the consumers and respect them they consider how recommendations affect followers and avoid such things you know which are harmful which can be harmful to the environment, harmful to the health of the people like pan masala or uh, anything which can be detrimental to the, to the environment. So they would like to avoid that. And uh, so that was about the ethics of social media influencers. So if there are any questions, uh, we, can, we can take those questions. Feel free to ask any question and then we will move on to the ethics in respect of two other areas, that is artificial intelligence and also the war. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question is pertaining regarding to the uh, ethical responsibility of major uh, social media companies, because right now we are talking about this uh, ethical responsibility of the only influencer, because the ma major power lies with the uh, social media company. Basically, we use the word fang companies. How? Uh, what should be the course of regulation across India and across the globe regarding these companies? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very pertinent question. Uh, the one problem which India has always been facing is that, uh, uh, that most of these companies, uh, the, which are the social media, they are located outside the country. And we do not have any control as such over them, uh, over the data bank which they have. But uh, uh, over a period of time, we have found, for example, uh, internet operations had to be stopped in, in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay? And uh, many other places where social media was uh, giving rise to uh, a communal disharmony uh, between two communities or two religions. So therefore, there is no doubt about it that we have still not come to the level of democracy as some other countries have become. So we need to practice some regulation before that. Though the ideally uh, it should be self-regulation, but my view is that self-regulation comes only when you have a very, very matured, uh, you know, everyone is so matured enough that one is able to control oneself. Therefore, in India, we have a diversity and there are many situations which develop on account of uh, social media. So therefore, uh, we need to definitely have a control over the social media, but maybe over a period of time, they can ultimately become uh, self-regulating also. Because ultimately, what is the end result? The end thing is that harmony amongst the people. If the social media leads to disharmony, then what is the point of social media? In fact, uh, uh, we have seen many times what happened that uh, in, in certain states of this country, uh, two uh, communities and two religions and two group of people, they uh, started uh, acting against each other because someone had tried to uh, project something on the social media, hate words. And secondly, I think 
you know, uh, uh, the higher technologies, they provide for uh, blocking certain words, you see, on the, uh, on the internet. So, uh, uh, for example, let me just say, you know, some of the developed countries, the, they, they know, they are hearing, overhearing all the telephonic conversations and WhatsApp. So, so wherever a word, say for example, terror comes or uh, any similar word comes, so immediately it is detected because it may lead to some kind of a problem at it. So my view is, yes, there is a need in India to control the social media because social media is a double-edged weapon. It has got its pros, which are immense. There are so many pros, but there are cons also. And such scrupulous, you know, and and anti-social elements which resort to the using the social media to their uh, advantage uh, in, in, in exchange for creating a bad blood, I think they have to be stopped. And you know, sir, what happens is I always say that there are four types of, uh, uh, you know, people in this world. So the four types of people, uh, the two things which are important, again, is values and skills. If you have, uh, you are aware about values, we have talked about the values, values and skills and competencies. So V and S, they are important. So the four quadrants are, if you plot values on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis you plot skills, then the best people are those who have got high values, high skills. Isn't it? High values, high skills, that will be the best. They are the heroes, they are the star. But the worst people are those who have got great skills but very low values. Osama bin Laden, or uh, you can take Natwar Lal, or Harshad Mehta, or Ketan Parekh, or uh, uh, people uh, even like Vijay Malia, or Nirav Modi, or Choksi, they have got huge skills, but they have got very low values. So therefore, social media is sometimes used by such people to create bad blood or anguish amongst the communities. And ultimately, the aim of the government is to maintain peace and harmony amongst this. Because if we have to divert all our energies towards them, then we will not be in a position to divert uh, money and energy towards the more important things, that is education and health and social welfare. So I think that for some time, at least, uh, there is a need. Though in Western countries, which are much more disciplined, uh, I'm not saying India is not disciplined, but India and the Western countries, there is a difference in the sense that there is a certain amount of self-regulation which they like to practice because they are perhaps more ethical. And that is understandable because democracy uh, has got its own positives and it's got its own problems. It takes time to mature the democracy. My view uh, to your question is that yes, regulation is necessary. Ideally, self-regulation would be the best, but to say that stop social media because it is producing these results is not a correct thing. You have to have social media because it is one of the cheapest modes of conveying your you know, ideas to the entire world. There used to be a time when only print media and electronic media were there and it was so difficult for anyone to bring out their ideas. Now you can say everything on the social media and you can communicate with the entire world in a very cheap manner and quickly without wasting any time. This is how the railways has become one of the biggest uh, and important departments of government of India which is using social media. Its Facebook and Twitter handle is one of the best in the country and they engage themselves with the, with the passengers and the passengers bring to their notice ki sahab ye train late chal rahi hai, yahan par platform par garbage pada hua hai, yahan air conditioner kaam nahi kar raha hai, ye improvements aap system mein la sakte hai. So social media is a game changer, there is no doubt about it. And again, as a cost of repetition, I say, whenever you come out with new things, there is a positive, there is a negative. So when you will give answer to that, you will say social media has got these pros and therefore it is necessary that we encourage social media, but at the same time, to take care of these people who have got low values, very high skills, you have to control the regulate the social media. Maybe right now regulation is necessary. Over a period of time, self-regulation will be possible. Government currently launched uh, a rule endorsement guideline program for celebrities and uh, social media influencers under the Consumer Protection Act 2019. Uh, how can this will uh, check the social media influencer? Because 
we saw the social media and influencer every time changing from day to day, time to time. You mean to say that the, the, the you can you keep on changing the celebrities yes, sir. or the influencers? And how can this act uh, check the uh, social media influencer? Because their put, uh, their social media is uh, time to time changing and uh, time to time evolving. Uh, you mean to say that the, the the amendment will become outdated over a period yes, of sir. time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So so therefore, uh, what uh, the the only way to do this thing is that the government must constitute a group of people, experts, who should constantly look into the regulations and as time evolves, they must keep on changing and bringing about the amendments. Your point is absolutely correct. As the technology is evolving, uh, the IT Act which was uh, brought in, it has undergone now many amendments because it has, uh, there a lot of uh, water has flown in the Ganges. So therefore, uh, your point is correct that just by one amendment, you cannot bring it about. You have to evolve it over a period of time. And that can only be done by having an expert group or a regulator having expert people who should keep on reviewing them, bringing about the necessary amendments, which is necessary for even, even say, uh, after so many years, we have been able to bring about an amendment in the Indian Penal Code. Mr. Amit Shah, the Home Minister, recently introduced uh, the Indian Penal Code. Because they thought that over a period of time, lot many new things have come in the society which necessitate uh, making an amendment in the act. So it is always evolving and one must keep uh, abreast of the times always. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we have seen these days that IS and IPS officer acting as social influencer. Means they have channel on YouTube. And one of the chief characteristics of civil servant is that uh, they remain they should remain anonymous so how to draw line between anonymity and uh, being uh, uh, means propagating uh, some useful information okay so that's a uh, very relevant question and uh, contentious question also before social media came into force uh, there was no question of a civil servant trying to gain popularity and the conduct rules still say the same thing. Those civil servants who try to become popular, they must understand. And this is with very humility at my command, I'm going to tell all of you, because all of you will ultimately become civil servants. That humility is one thing which a civil servant must display, number one. Number two, facelessness. A civil servant must be faceless like an army. Army remains in the background. The civil servant must remain in the background. The job of the civil servant is not to gain popularity. That is the job of the politician. Because politician has to get himself elected after every five years. A civil servant is going to remain for 35 years. So therefore, if you ask for my view, social media again has got a very positive things to say. The social media should be used by the civil servants only in propagating the schemes and policies of the government and not to propagate oneself. Many, uh, unfortunately, without naming, I would say many civil servants, they carry a cameraman along with them and they go uh, to the areas and they will carry out uh, raids, they will slap someone, they will throw the, my, the mobile phone of someone, all these things you must have seen on the social media. Now, it shows the civil servant in a very bad light. And a civil servant trying to, uh, um, uh, you know, go in different uh, ways, for example, popularizing certain dresses or, you know, uh, everyday event, uh, just like uh, Facebook doing it. I'm not against any such thing. But then you are a civil servant. Once you have decided to join civil service, you have to be bound by certain conduct rules. A civil servant is not expected to go to the press unless he has to propagate a particular scheme or, or a program or a public policy of the government. Otherwise, a civil servant should not go to the social media. That is a point I would very humbly submit to all of you. Don't try to popularize for two reasons. Number one, why? there are two reasons. Whatever goes in the virtual world will remain for all times to come. Anyone after five years, ten years will be able to take out a video of yours and say that this is that civil servant who had spoken 
this thing, which may be outrageous. It may be against government policy. And you will be unnecessarily brought to books, disciplinary action. So that is one thing. And the second thing why we should not uh, uh, you know, the, use this particular thing is, is that the seniors and the politicians, you will be unnecessarily you know, annoying them. Nobody will like that my junior man is in social media. Ke samne. It's human nature. Why do you want to do that? You have joined civil service. Civils, being a civil servant itself is a great honor. Why do you need to be on the social media? So on account of these two reasons, it is my sincere advice to all of you when you will join and at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration for the foundation course, many people uh, will try to uh, you know come on the social media and they will say how i cracked my examination you know this is something which i i am amazed sometime why do you have to do that you know let everyone do itself and it creates a lot of confusion also people are coming and they they are coming at mocks also serving officers so my view is i'm not against any such thing social media is a good thing but civil servants have to be very circumspect while using the social media. So ethics of war, first of all the context setting, then I will come to slightly detailed presentation also, but first of all let me set the context. Gandhiji said that there is no such thing like just war or unjust war, all the wars are unjust. Different people have got different sayings and that is why in the GS4 paper you have got uh, you know one particular uh, topic which is that the philosophers and the and the great people of this world what do they say about different values uh, and so on so therefore ethics of war so what is war uh, war is defined uh, differently by different sets of people so uh, there was a prussian a military general he defined war as an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to fulfill our will apni uh, Prabhuta or Akhandata ko dusre ke upar dalne ke liye hum jo kuch karte hai, wo war hota hai. So that we compel that person to do certain things. So war is a phenomenon of organized collective violence that it is organized. Russia-Ukraine war is an organized, you see. So the entire Russia, Russian army and air force, you know, combines together. So it's an organized collective violence that affects either the relation between two or more societies or the power relations within a society. So that is war. The need of ethics in war. Why do we need ethics in war? So number one is respect for human dignity, human rights. Obviously, we have to respect each other. We are all human beings. Every one of us has to respect the other human beings. And minimizing environmental impact. So whenever there is a war, there is an environmental impact. Why? Blast, yeah, so explosions and blast and missiles and uh, gases which are uh, thrown in the atmosphere. Third is minimize harm. So minimize harms is particularly people, even those who are not even connected with the war, their lives are also at stake. <coughs> hmm? Civilian casualties, absolutely right. So civilian casualties. And fourth is medical ethics. So medical ethics, as you know that uh, whether that uh, person uh, who is uh, injured belongs to <coughs> this country or the other country uh, deserves the same treatment uh, as far as medical ethics are concerned. <coughs> so how can war be ethical? <coughs> just cause. So the war must be justified. Morally sound reason. Now, when we talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine, what is your view? Is it justifiable? Yeah, Russian perspective or Ukraine's perspective? Both the perspective. In my opinion, if we are seeing from a Ukraine perspective, then war is justified by retaliation and saving themselves from uh, saving their own country, motherland in the name of sovereignty, uh, integrity, and saving their own country. Uh, this is uh, specifically from a Ukraine perspective. 
and along with that the whole geopolitics around it if we are seeing from a russian perspective it is justified in two manners a it is justified from uh, coal politics uh, already that has happened and the perseverance that is done by usa just to coming at the backyard of U uh, russia if someone we feel is threatening your backyard so you will be most vigilant and you will go for uh, your war this is justification from russian side and other than this justification from ukraine side absolutely correct brilliant uh, so sometimes a question is asked in the interview also that uh, supposing you are the mediator so how will you decide now that russia ukraine war which has progressed so much in on what terms and condition would you be able to decide that how you can bring it to a close so such kind of question also typical questions are asked there and uh, you take some time to register so you must be prepared for all these kinds of question uh, that uh, if you are the mediator what will you decide at that point of time okay so uh, it should be since self defense that is responding to imminent severe threats last resort after exhausting peaceful means so it should be the last resort we should first of all try the negotiation okay and negotiation is done by the diplomats diplomatic channels by the way who were the oldest diplomats in this world <laughs> hanuman and krishna so hanuman and krishna are regarded as the oldest diplomats in this world okay and right intention so addressing human rights violations so this is these are the four uh, requirements of a war in order to be ethical you see there are two theories in ethics uh, i'm sure all of you must have studied it one is called uh, utilitarian principle or teleological principle and the other is called deontological principle so in the case of uh, utilitarian principle which is the more common one adopted in administration where ends justify the means and uh, therefore uh, many times you tell a lie or you commit something which may not be strictly legal but if it produces happiness in the end then it is justified and the second is the de de deontological approach which says no no ends are not important it is the means which are important and therefore sometimes you have a combination of both teleological as well as deontological principle take an example there is an aircraft which is flying at a height there are 200 passengers in that aircraft and that aircraft is hijacked by the terrorists and it has uh, maneuvered the aircraft towards a high rise building multi storied building where there are 50000 people in that building it is going to strike that building sooner or later and you are there sitting on the ground you have got an anti aircraft gun you can point that gun towards that aircraft and bring down that aircraft and thereby saving those 50000 people which are there in that high rise building but if you bring down that plane you will be killing those 200 people so you will be murdering them and murder is unethical so therefore the deontological principle will say that no 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 whether those 50000 people remain or not it's not important you cannot use that like murdering those people you will not bring that plane down but the utilitarian or teleological will say no you bring down those two plane and 250000 is greater than 200 so the greatest good of the greatest number principle will apply now why this is justifiable in this case is another reason because those 200 people in any case they are going to die when that aircraft is going to strike that high rise building those 200 people in any case they are going to die so therefore if you bring down that plane you will be able to save those 50000 people so therefore ends in in a large number of cases justify the means so the right intention addressing human rights violation last resort so these are the ethical issues in war so disregard for human life it's an ethical issue one must regard human life regard that forced displacement forced displacement what is that yeah they have to be evacuated and sometimes migration also migration takes place in the case of ukraine the migration took place to poland and some other countries then of course economic instability so whenever there is a war 
the prices go up, the inflation goes up, economic disability uh, is instability is there. There is a the paucity of the commodities is there, and therefore people are put to lot of trouble and uh, mass destruction. Obviously, environmental damage takes place, and human rights violation also take place. So these are the ethical issues which encompass the war situation. Okay. So philosophical views on war. There are many uh, theories. So realism theory is which says that real is take a realistic view and war outside conventional moral bounds. There is nothing like morality or ethics or values. One should be realistic about it. Focus on victory and state interest. So one should be only guided by the state interest. One should not be bothered about human rights violation or ethics and values and morals. The second is pacifism. It is just opposite of that. Oppose violence. Advocate for non-violence conflict resolution. So they say that talks must go on. We should never resort to uh, violence, and it is totally uh, it abhors war. And just war theory is a set of criterion for justifying war, ethical conduct during war, and principles for post-war reconciliation. So emphasizing justice. Proportionality and respect for human rights. So it should be proportional. That means the damage should be proportional to the ends which we are envisaging. It should not be too large. It should be proportional to that. And emphasizing justice, one should have a ceasefire as quickly as possible. The moment it is found, unfortunately, in the case of Russia, Ukraine, it has not happened. But so the proportionality and the the reconciliation as quickly as possible. And respect for human rights. So these are the views of prominent thinkers. Uh, it's it's all there. And uh, whenever you give any answer in the examination, uh, all or even in the interview, uh, you must give examples. Examples always strengthen uh, our, your answer, and they make your answer much more impressive. So try to give an uh, example. Now you see, as I told you yesterday also. Those of you who were present, that it is a 20 minutes interview, and uh, you get uh, uh, you have to make uh, your presence felt in those 20 minutes. So try to field as many questions as possible, and therefore you have to give uh, answers which are to the point, succinct. Don't beat about the bush because you will not be in a position to take many questions then. And one thing which I said that try to answer the last question very well. That is ultimately when you leave the board. And you will be awarded on that at that time. So try to take that question in the best possible manner. I'm not saying it is easy; it's very difficult to judge. But you can look at the watch and you see that almost 20 minutes are over. So you can think that the last questions is about to arrive. Try to answer in the best possible manner. Okay. So modern warfare complexity, the technological innovations, and non-state actors. And now, they, who are these non-state actors? Ha, huh. ha, huh. yes. Uh, what are these people called? Mm, Hamas is there, definitely. Hamas is and, uh, eh? yeah. So, so these people who work for money, what are they called? Mercenaries. So, mercenaries also take over, which are non-state actor, and Hamas is also a similar organization, which also takes over. So, non-state actors have now come. Uh, and that is more challenging now because state is still bound by certain rules and regulation, but non-state actors, it's very difficult to control them. And uh, technological advantages, so drones have come and uh, cyber weapons potentially reduce collateral damage. So therefore, these uh, technical advantages are there in the case of war. So drones and cyber uh, weapons are there. And uh, misuse uh, concerns are there, risks of targeting civilians and infrastructure. Whenever there is a war, there is always uh, you know, the, the civilians who are the children, the senior citizens, and, uh, and the women. They are the affected in a great way. And that is why uh, when Ukraine ultimately, when the war will end, the greatest challenge will be to take care of these uh, sections of the society how to bring them up again, the children and the women and the senior citizens. 
and evolving standards so updating legal and ethical framework for new warfare technology so it is an evolving thing we must keep on ev evolving uh, you know things keeping in view what is happening now with the passage of time you have to evolve over a period of time nothing is stationary change is imminent and change is required so therefore people must group together but one of the sadly one of the institution which is required to deliberate on the issue now which is that institution which has still not been able to stop that russia ukraine war un so un has not proved to be uh, uh, efficient uh, or negotiator and uh, that is why we have uh, this war nobody listened to the united nation um, and then the 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 security council nations permanent members of the security council they dictate the entire thing because they also fund the world bank and the international monetary fund and others so therefore they can carry out the dictates okay so <clears throat> uh, emphasizing war as a last resort and the importance of diplomatic and non military means to resolve conflict that is some what normally and uh, you must uh, mention when we talk about uh, this war that the in the last uh, uh, statement given by our prime minister when he says that we have reached a situation in the world today when all these conflicts should be resolved cannot be resolved by war they have to be resolved by you know mutual yeah it's a diplomatic efforts and otherwise so try to bring in and whenever you uh, answer a question try to understand that you have to be slightly different or better than the others it's after all a competition so try to find out what is happening uh, the latest things which are happening for example mention of the summit on artificial intelligence and uh, similarly something happening in united nations so these things if you mention they always create a much greater impact okay so that was war um, i have got a full ppt on that and uh, maybe we can share that ppt also later on to the to the, all the all of them hai na ruchi theek hai yeah okay so uh, any questions which we have kar sakte hain bilkul kar sakte hain yes yes absolutely geneva protocol and conventions treaties uh, these all things can be added to that also genocide Irish Convention. Yes, to, sir. Following there are the, yes, order. yes, absolutely. There are so many examples. Uh, uh, in the case of war, for example, the question may be regarding Indo, uh, India, and Bangladesh. Uh, you know, uh, liberation of Bangladesh. Right. So, Indo Pak War, that was one, or the Kosovo War, uh, Kosovo. Uh, uh, you know, where United Nation intervened, or uh, Russia, or or um, USA Iraq War. Vietnam. So, uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War. so all these situations they can ask questions ki what is your view about this particular war so be prepared and indo uh, uh, indian foreign uh, relations with the other countries you see so that is one topic international relation which you must practice very well and also understand the problems which are being faced by the entire world nowadays so the problems like migration terrorism drugs environment climate change uh, aids sustainable migration ha huh? sustainable development sustainable development poverty so all these things which are global problems and uh, if you if you give a small quote also for example kofi annan one of the former secretary generals of united nations said that problems without passports require solutions without passports i'm sure some of you might have heard about it so he said that nowadays is the world is facing problems which travel from one part of the world to the another part without passports for example covid 19 or climate change or terrorism or aids these travel without the requirement of any passport and therefore they require solutions without passports that means all the countries must think as a whole the entire world they must put their minds together without passports to come up with an amicable solution to these problems so uh, any other questions on war yes sir 
as you have uh, spoken that um, russia is justified by uh, attacking ukraine and at the same time ukraine's point of view is also justified in their own uh, mm. perspective so uh, but how do we find a common ground i mean uh, what i mean to ask is how do we find out ways and means in order to keep uh, in order to ensure that war doesn't really take place mm. what is the common ground yeah so uh, very pertinent question uh, the the common ground was the purpose was to create united nations was this only that uh, they will not allow the wars to, but the, must, one must give credit to united nation also that apart from russia ukraine war for many many years there has not been many wars you see so to some extent it has been useful also so uh, there has to be more teeth has to be given to the united nation the bretton wood institutions also need a reform the security council also need to have a broad base so that different viewpoints come from different countries and they are in a position to stop such situations when a war erupts so my uh, view is that whereas the, the the top powers will continue to have their say but i think now more and more economic growth of the countries like china for example has become a very powerful force so i think india also will become a very powerful force in in dealing with uh, deciding on international matters so my view is that should be a multipolar world because multipolar world with acts as a check and balance if there is only one policeman like america naturally excesses will be there so in order to avoid such situations we must have checks and balances and a body which can uh, think about it and uh, uh, probably if india grows very very high in power then i think india should be able to uh, talk about uh, peace and harmony and principles of punch shield and other things your point is absolutely correct it is it is very difficult to stop war but uh, an attempt can be made by the by the by the security council countries to stop war cold war will continue amongst nations but i think uh, having giving more teeth to the united nation number 1 number 2 uh, having a multipolar world will definitely lead to uh, reducing the effects of war hmm ah they they themselves involved in war in fact most of the war conditions have initiated because of united Na states of america or russia so that is why i said unless and until their importance goes down and other countries come up uh, it will be uh, their hegemony will continue uh, 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 thank you for your enlightenment about this second uh, my question is pertaining to the counter of uh, this uh, argument that is we are already witnessing a strategic score in the uns unsc council oh. because that is used as a threat command for a strategic points for oh. uh, national interest Uh, if we argue with uh, your points then how far we can say if this uh, council is more diversified or given more tooth will it work for the purpose which uh, it is already built and purpose which we are we seeking yeah so why i i say in favor of this is that uh, there are almost 180 nations in the world and literally the the decisions are taken by only two three countries so therefore unless and until the united nation as a combined force of those 180 countries is able to exercise its kind of a veto or something it will be very difficult to counter these uh, countries don't you agree that on one hand you have united states and russia they are virtually calling the shot united kingdom has virtually gone down france is also not so much there these are the two countries and perhaps china has now come up but uh, on other hand all other countries are also rants so their importance uh, to my mind can only be come only come about when un is given more teeth and powers uh, this is already witnessed in context of wto mm. where uh, everyone has vo vote about this or cop 28 or all the conference of parties regarding the environmental concern and we have witnessed very long discussion and in terms of the outcome we are seeing it is not uh, what we are expecting so how far this go along with the uns itself <laughs> okay so your view point is that uh, if if the decision making is given to a larger body the decision making is not likely to come rather it will come only when there are only very small number of parties involved in, in that so that they can come to a conclusion 
uh, well your your point uh, uh, has got uh, an argument uh, which is quite uh, valid but um, my view is that uh, that uh, uh, in a world order uh, why should the world order be dictated by some policemen only why is it well, let me give you an example bhutan bhutan is the only country in the world which is a carbon negative country and in one of the environmental summits when uh, uh, and if you have uh, heard the speech given by the prime minister of bhutan on as one of the ted talks it is the excellent ted talk where he said that in those environmental summit when bhutan raised its hand and he said that we are a carbon negative country nobody heard us in the first place but later on in the second summit when we raised the issue then they took notice of it and then they started saying if bhutan can do it so can we so the developed countries were going on with their massive development drive leading to huge amount of environmental crisis but here was a country who was able to show to the world that you can remain inclusive you can bring down the the pollution levels and you can plan your environmental uh, you know the 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 environmental policies in such a way that uh, you you create a better world so uh, even small countries also should be allowed to make a difference this is my view otherwise people become dictatorial if given power too much of power united states has become a dictator it it interferes into practically every other country and so does uh, other country, um, even russia has also and china also so your point is correct in one way that uh, the consensus probably comes only when there are a small number of stakeholders or parties it may not the consensus building becomes very difficult when there are a large number of people like it happened in the case of wto when we said but at the same time over a period of time i think uh, the world must realize that every small country also has got a uh, wisdom and thinking power it is not only in the minds of the president of the united states of america <laughs> this is my view inclusivity is you know, leads to yes yes correct democrat correct so i would like to give that answer in that fashion sir yes sir my question is regarding the g20 consensus on the right. russia ukraine war and what is its effect on the war you see uh, whenever such things which uh, uh, you are referring to the point that there was no consensus no common resolution was reached uh, uh i think that it was it was very difficult to arrive at a common draft resolution uh, did we arrive at a common draft resolution ultimately we did ultimately we did but it took a very long time to decide upon the nuances and the commas and the full stops so what is the question which you want to ask that to the effect of that consensus on the war presently it is going on yeah so as i said that unless and until countries and g20 comprises of uh, all the important developed countries so once they have come out with a resolution i think it is definitely going to have a sobering effect on the russia ukraine it but we have not seen the result as of now isn't it so so therefore it only time can tell about it but this is not to say that we don't make efforts we have to criticize the war we have to say that war is unjust and therefore if we keep on harping on it again and again then probably sometime uh, uh, you know sense will better sense will prevail so uh, my answer to that question would be that just because we have not been able to achieve any particular result out of the resolution of g20 that does not mean that we stop making efforts and uh, because ultimately if you keep on uh, pressing uh, and coming out with resolutions and 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 uh, talking about an issue then people will take notice of that also so this is uh, a kind of thing that we must always uh, be futuristic and optimistic for the future so uh, you don't agree you don't think that it will result in a but supposing they have not come out with any resolution what would have been this thing they would have then in a way advocated and would have uh, sort of sided with uh, russia the very fact that they came out with a resolution even after lot of deliberation 
but ultimately they did which shows that uh, war is never uh, uh, a thing which is it's never a panacea for anything and every country in the world wants peace ultimately because if it is not if it is war it is at the expense of other developmental activities education and health and social welfare so therefore uh, i think every effort must be made and uh, uh, whatever you may say the prime minister of india has been making uh, efforts to uh, to bring about and people are recognizing india as a country which matters nowadays hmm? yes ma'am you wanted to ask this ha hindi mein boliye koi dikkat nahi जैसे कि मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि जब रसिया यूक्रेन का जो वॉर हुआ उसमें तो किसी का फायदा हुआ नहीं हुआ तो वो पॉलिटिशियंस का हुआ न एज अ पब्लिक तो किसी का फायदा बस बच्चे मा, मा, मारे जा रहे हैं वुमेंस मारी जा रही हैं मेंस एंड एज लाइक अ स्कैंडेवियन कंट्रीज तो वो लोग तो अपने पब्लिक पे ही जो खर्च करते हैं वो मतलब उन्हीं की मतलब ह्यूमन डेवलपमेंट को उन लोग आगे बढ़ाना चाहते हैं बट हम ऐसा क्यों नहीं कर सकते हैं कि रसिया यूक्रेन का जो मतलब वो होना नहीं चाहिए हाउ वी कैन से कि वॉर इज जस्ट हाँ नहीं रशिया यूक्रेन वॉर को जस्ट कोई नहीं कह रहा है लेकिन ये कह रहे हैं कि हम अगर उनके व्यू पॉइंट से देखें तो रशिया का अपना एक व्यू पॉइंट है और यूक्रेन का अपना एक व्यू पॉइंट है क्योंकि उसको अपनी टेरिटरीज को डिफेंड करना है वॉर हैज़ गॉट डिफरेंट फिलोसफर्स हैव टॉक डिफरेंटली सम पीपल से कि वॉर इज जस्टिफाइड फॉर एग्जाम्पल अगर ऑपरेशन होता है किसी एक कम्युनिटी को वाइप आउट कर देते हैं जैसे कि कई जगहों पर हुआ कि एक कम्युनिटी अब अब फॉर एग्जाम्पल नाजीज हिटलर दे वॉन्टेड टू वाइप आउट ज्यूज देयर इफ द कंट्रीज केम ऑन इट द वॉर वॉज जस्टिफाइड सो वॉर इन सर्टन सिचुएशन कैन बी जस्टिफाइड बट हेयर इन दिस रशिया यूक्रेन it's a very very uh, uh, situation which is a gray area and uh, it's very difficult to side either with ukraine or with russia that is why the prime minister chose not to side with any one of them strategic advantage and that was the policy so therefore no doubt the prime minister gave lot of aid to the ukraine uh, in support of the people there which is your point is absolutely aapka kehna bilkul sahi hai वहाँ पर जो महिलाएं जो बच्चे जो सीनियर uh, सिटीजन्स थे उनको जिस प्रकार की यातना और प्रताड़ना से गुजरना पड़ा है तो उसको देखते हुए वॉर को किसी हालत में भी जो है हम जायज़ नहीं ठहरा सकते हैं लेकिन इस सिचुएशन में जबकि रशिया का अपना व्यू पॉइंट है तो इसीलिए मैंने कहा था कि किसी हायर बॉडी को अल्टीमेटली इंटरवीन तो करना पड़ेगा तो चाहे वो जी का रेजोल्यूशन हो चाहे यूनाइटेड नेशन का हो किसी ने तो करना पड़ेगा इसके अंदर सर तो ये रसिया का एज अ पॉलिटिशियन व्यू है एंड यूक्रेन का वो जो पॉलिटिशियन व्यू है पब्लिक का तो व्यू है नहीं बट उसमें तो घटा घटा पब्लिक को ही हो रही है बिल्कुल ठीक आप कह रहे हैं क्या होता है कि हमारा जो पॉलिटिकल सिस्टम है उसमें फॉल्ट तो है ही समटाइम्स हम लोग को ये लगता है कि जो पीपल्स रिप्रजेंटेटिव हैं दे रिप्रजेंट द वॉइस ऑफ द पीपल and uh, many times what happens is ki recall of public representative bhi isi liye kaha jata hai kyunki jo public ka hai wo unke representative ka view point jo hai unke alag ho sakta hai to aapka kehna sahi hai ki yahan par chahe wo putin ho chahe is taraf jo hai unka uh, pradhan mantri jo hai maine <coughs> just ki either way it may not coincide with the views of the public but then they have elected him yeah. and in a in a country which is run by on lines of democracy or whatever uh, communism whatever rules they take decisions on behalf of the public ab yahan bhi to dekhiye na sare decision jo hai government leti on behalf of the public many of the views you may not agree with the views taken by the prime minister or by the minister or by the government but then that is how it works um, it's it's not a very neat solution ऐसी कोई डेमोक्रेसी अभी आई नहीं है जिसके अंदर कि कोई ऐसा हो सके कि कोइंसाइड कर दे क्योंकि वो तभी संभव है जबकि रिकॉल ऑफ पब्लिक रिप्रेजेंटेटिव्स का पॉसिबल हो सके कि भाई इनको वापस बुलाओ इन जिस कारण से आए थे उस कारण से जो है इन्होंने पर्पस पूरा नहीं हाँ 
नहीं है हाँ नहीं बिल्कुल सही है हाँ हाँ करेक्ट यू आर राइट लोकल बॉडीज में है होना चाहिए आई थिंक एज एज डेमोक्रेसी विल डेवलप शायद ये होगा इसके अंदर ओके एनी यस मैम time uh, india did describe the russia ukraine war as a conflict and uh, some others describe it as a war some describe it as an invasion so what do these different words mean like uh, how do we say why are people using different words for this okay so uh, all situations of war or invasion they arise out of a conflict the root thing is the conflict conflict is disagreement or um, not uh, having a difference of opinion or uh, 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 ego problems so these are the reasons for the conflict or apportionment of resources the apportionment of resources if you want a higher territory you want more territory so you want to cede that territory so conflict is the root cause it leads to uh, uh, either a cold war or it can lead to Uh, the main war or invasion invasion is also invading the other country and uh, war is also uh, similar we interchangeably use these things the prime minister use the word conflict because uh, conflict uh, generally should be decided as quickly as possible but war is something which is much more lethal it leads to much greater disturbance for example conflict can be uh, can can be such which may not be uh, If, if for example uh, you may may not be talking to the person on the right and that is because of a conflict but it's a very simple kind of a conflict but a more forceful kind of conflict when someone inflicts an injury on to the other person that is a much serious kind of conflict so conflict can be ordinary one also it can be serious one also war is a very serious kind of conflict where a group of uh, people combined efforts of the state that goes conflict can be from one person to another person also but a war is a combined thing when the prime minister mentioned that thing as a word conflict he probably thought that uh, conflict uh, this is a small uh, disagreement of the ideas it will sooner get over but it did not get over and therefore conflict has led to a situation of now war yes is it uh, 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 are you uh, satisfied with that uh, definition or you have something more to offer yeah, if you want to say something yeah uh, because uh, we are again like you said we are not on the side of russia or ukraine we've chosen yes. to say yes. that there should be peace so uh, our so, description yes. of it as so a india uh, use a mild word mm -hmm. so that it does not give an impression Uh, of being siding with any one of them so conflict is a mild word which may ultimately lead to a war like situation and india didn't want to take sides well that is the has been the all along the 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 principle which it is punch shield or otherwise that we will not non aligned movement we will not take sides so in a way the foreign policy of india has remained unchanged and it does not want to take sides so uh, war would have been a war would be very strong word to use and probably prime minister was conscious of this fact yes sir thank you uh hello my question is with her alignment uh, alignment argument that is it is uh, the the terms which which we are using uh, whether it's a war invasion and conflict are they not only about the definition or it is also about your geopolitical situation or understanding of that situation because uh, from european uh, european perspective it might be invasion from india's perspective it is a conflict and from russia's perspective it is a war for reoccupation or something else yes yeah absolutely right it can also be on account of uh, the geopolitical situation how you perceive that particular conflict but every war is also a conflict because without a conflict the war will not happen can a war happen without a conflict no sir so conflict is the origin 
of every war or invasion. But war and invasion assumes, uh, you know, at a later stage of time. Initially, it starts with a simple conflict. Sometimes the conflict can be solved by diplomatic relations also. When the, you know, and sometimes even you recall the ambassador giving an impression that we, we feel bad about it. So, conflict can be resolved in many ways. But when it cannot get resolved by ordinary diplomatic means, then, uh, you know, a situation like uh, a war happens. And that is why uh, your point is also correct that uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, Russia, it would be a war. From the point of view of uh, Ukraine, it would be an invasion. From the point of view of India, which is a kind of a balancing act, where he will, they will say it's a conflict. But conflict is the root word. Without conflict, nothing can happen. Uh in alignment with this, my second question is about, is there any consensus about this word uh, on international level or they are loosely defined uh, just by uh, like convention or use? To, uh, I'm not very sure about it. To the best of my knowledge, they are generally used interchangeably, but this needs to be checked. I, because you see what happens is that different uh, conventions uh, whether it is uh, the convention at the United Nations level or uh, Geneva Convention. So they have used uh, different words at different places. And therefore, I think it needs to be checked. Uh, what is the technical definition of these three things at different uh, places um, at the world level? There is a true pro protocol, sir. Months before, in, in an article, they are putting that uh, there are two words, uh, some Irish or some other countries words, some difficult word they are putting that they are defining com conflict or war also oh. in the situation wise. Uh, on the war of uh, uh, Israel or Hamas. We will the, say, it's a? They are defining the conflict and war. And the war. On the basis of some... Uh, Typical term, I didn't remember. That. Yeah, actually what happens is that over a period of time, new words emerge. For example, uh, global warming, uh, a word emerged. Some environmentalists started using global warming. Someone said climate change. <laughs> yes. So, so therefore, what happens is over a period of time, different words do come into force. And uh, different foras describe that differently. So one needs to be abreast of... Uh, the, the words which are uh, in use. And uh, uh, I, in, in ethics also paper, for example, there is a uh, glossary, which I'm sure all of you must have gone through, that uh, what is the meaning of different words. So the glossary you must go through. And uh, in writing your GS4 paper also, always pay attention to the glossary. Uh, what is integrity? What is accountability? What is truthfulness? What is objectivity? What is rationality? so uh, and, and in legal terms also, there is, a, there, there is a, always a law lexicon, which I'm sh some of you might have read. Law lexicon talks about all the legal terms which are there. Uh, whenever we talk about UN reforms, yes. we say that uh, UN should be given more teeth and some coercive power should be there. Yes. But in the multipolar world, where there is an increase in bilateral agreements, as, as we have seen in uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict also, that sanctions really did not work and there were other countries who did engage with Russia and were accused that they are fueling the war. So what type of coercive power should be given to UN and even if given, is that really effective? Okay, so uh, yeah, the, it's, it's difficult to delineate at this moment. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, you are absolutely right now more and more uh, decision making is done through the treaties and agreements and the groups of nations which are they are wielding much more power as compared to the united nation so that is a fact and that in fact speaks about the non effectiveness of united nation because if the united nation was effective what was the need of such nations coming together so my view is that the united nation uh, must uh, uh, create a special group of uh, nations which should uh, deliberate on what powers can be given to United Nations to stop war or uh, to impose sanctions and effectively execute those sanctions. And for example, even in the case of justice, International Court of Justice, now whether it is being implemented 
in the best possible manner it is not so so uh, at the international level it becomes very difficult to enforce something in another country but uh, i think uh, if they if they work on that and pass a resolution in the united nations general assembly by having agreed to certain things i think uh, some powers can be given for example united nation has got power to send uh, you know its uh, uh, forces so peacekeeping forces to the different uh, situations so i think uh, similarly some kind of things can be i'm sure a lot of uh, deliberations must already been going on that regarding uh, improvement uh, or restructuring of the breton wood institutions and the united nation and the security council one thing is certain if the security council has more permanent members definitely it will have uh, a greater say and i think uh, one more thing which is required is removal of the veto power which has been given to the this i think such kind of uh, structuring uh, so can we say that instead of having more permanent member can we emulate the parliamentary form of government in the international level where the unsc acts as a cabinet whose members are elected from the unga no but uh, this is to govern the the, the united nations yeah, like to take the decisions that and everything of, that 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 also has been uh, cited as one of the Uh, very good solutions that uh, united nation can agree to have a parliamentary system where the decisions are taken in the same way as in a democratic country it is taken yes it, it is a definitely a solution all the countries must agree uh, to come to that and i think if that is done then probably it will have its uh, uh, effective force also a uh, mandate also and uh, to effectively execute that so it's a good good solution good answer also thank you sir yeah Yes. Uh, sir, in the two major uh, wars that are going on today, one is uh, that's going on between Israel, Hamas, and second in Russia, Ukraine. So, sir, um, when we talk about ending these wars or ending, uh, coming to a peaceful agreement, uh, sir, how do we uh, convince nations like uh, Russia or Israel, which have uh, announced very high goals for themselves for instance israel has announced that its goal is to eradicate hamas and till it does not achieve that it will not back out and if it does back out at this point of course it will have some consequences for uh, the internal politics as well because many israelis were brutally killed and how do they justify that we use so many resources we cause so much damage and we have not met our goal also so then how do we uh, come to an end and how do we tell them that they should end okay. it's very pertinent question would anyone like to give uh, reply yeah let's have here some views yes my view about uh, israel hamas conflict uh, is on two or three basis point first uh, when 7 october has happened the world was around and along with the support of israel a because of the brutality that is done by hamas but with that brutality what action has taken by israel that was now which was a favor has gone against because as we are right in right now uh, read about war theory when we talk about war, war theory we understand about what are uh, what kind of nature of war and how long uh, for that we should be fought and as we are understanding right now the uh, mission which uh, israel has given to themselves is not serving uh, even for their own purpose because uh, his uh, their strongest allies like usa they definitely have defended them in unga but uh, president biden has already condemned them about the strategy and the dis destruction which is done uh, in gaza specifically first the displacement in northern gaza then uh, that is uh, after the uh, invasion the displacement in the southern gaza now this is always going around the forced displacement and this will lead to more radicalization and the post war conflict will be much tougher and more in uh, more sensitive uh, so in that regard 
that that conflict and the, what we are doing the post conflict that is more important and specifically uh, when mr biden has given uh, the uh, assessment about us's taliban and afghanistan conflict because because of uh, 911 when happened afghanistan uh, was attacked by taliban and we have seen the, the course of history after that so uh, the conflict and the responsibility by Israel has to be, has to match around this. That's why India even has changed its position. First, in first vote of, vote of UNGA, India was abstained. But right now, India, even in the uh, recent uh, resolution, India has called for uh, ceasefire along with 150 nation. And that shows uh, what is the uh, international sentiment about the war. OK. Good. You wanted to speak? So, uh, anyone else would like to make any comment on that? So, the fact is uh, that in this situation, my view is that it is, has to be a world opinion, consensus opinion, which has to emerge against the two wars. Now, Russia-Ukraine uh, war also slowly, uh, people have come to realize that um, uh, no purpose is being served and he is, the, Mr. Putin is being called as uh, equivalent to uh, what Hitler used to be called nowadays. Uh, so therefore, the effort has to be made twofold. Number one, by the Security Council members, which are the more powerful people, and also the United Nations. So I think over a period of time, the, the wisdom should come down upon the, the, the countries like United States of America and the, the USSR to stop such wars which are taking place uh, and in, in the case of Israel, and Hamas. And uh, as regards Russia, Ukraine, I think United Nations, uh, as well as United States of America, they are the, the people who can actually call the shots. No neat solution, no doubt about it. But uh, the solution will have to be based on the adage that we keep on talking and talking and talking and uh, talking about uh, the good things and the bad things. And ultimately, probably, wisdom will prevail. So that is how I think just like a G20 resolution uh, did give a message to the world. Similarly, the message which has been given now uh, by, the, in, uh, by the India and the, the United States of America, having seen that initially they were all in favor of Israel, but now Israel has gone uh, uh, to the other side by committing the same amount of brutality which the Hamas was doing. So I think now people it has changed the people's opinion. But uh, again, uh, coming back to that thing, situation like war at the international level cannot be uh, you know stopped as such unless and until you in the in there is a greater inclusivity in the security council because for maintenance of world order it is the security council which actually is very important and therefore number one is inclusivity number two is that uh, we must uh, ensure that the the groups of nations they come together and they vociferously express their views against such brutalities, against such wars. Because United Nations as such nowadays is not that powerful. But the long-term solution lies in making the United Nations a much more powerful nation. So therefore, uh, I think all the three things will have to be done. As I said, that international relation is not something which is 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. It, uh, it requires a lot of uh, time and deliberation to bring about uh, a consensus and decision making. So, okay. Any other uh, question? You can ask me any question on even civil services also. Okay. Not necessarily. You can ask about personality or the interview. You can ask about anything. Uh, you want to ask me? Yeah, so can sure. you share some uh, one or two incidents uh, where you have shown these values and uh, faced some difficulties and uh, okay. you know how you overcome from them? So I want to know okay. one or two like okay. matlab that. So uh, uh, just to quote one instance which I faced, there are about uh, two dozen instances and this is what makes the civil service unique. You come across such great experiences in civil service which you cannot even imagine in any other service and that is why for the next hundred years civil services will continue to be the best service in this country so i was the collector of chandigarh uh, collector is the district officer who is named after in three ways 
uh, he is called collector, he is called district magistrate, he is called deputy commissioner. There are other names also like district election officer, returning officer uh, and so on. So he wears many hats and as I was saying that the, the Nainital Uttarakhand, now in Uttarakhand, but uh, it was earlier in UP. So one of the directors, uh, Mukul Sanwal, I had gone to attend the seminar, DMSP seminar. So the DMSP seminar, where from each district, the DM and SP, both of them were invited to deliberate on the topics of law and order. So I had gone there, Mukul Sanwal was a director, and uh, he said that I had put a working group of young officers to find out under various acts and rules how many places the collector has got the powers and we found that almost 200 acts and rules we had the power given to the collector so that is the power which the district officer exercises that is what civil service exercises i became the collector of chandigarh at a bare uh, i i had 77 batch i got uh, became collector of karnal in 84 seven years i became collector of karnal and after two years, I became collector of Chandigarh, which is a union territory. So Chandigarh union territory is governed by the Ministry of Home Affairs. And uh, the Home Minister is the in charge, but the local governance is entrusted to the Governor of Punjab, who is called as Administrator of UT Chandigarh. So Mr. Siddhar Shankar Ray was the, the Governor of uh, Punjab. And uh, so the day I took over, uh, I remained there for six years as the collector and uh, those were very difficult days and uh, people, uh, the terrorism was at its peak in Punjab and Chandigarh. In the evening, uh, after five o'clock, the, all the roads will be deserted, the, the, the restaurants and the hotels will be empty, the, the colleges and schools, the terrorists had given them a warning that they would not play national anthem inside their schools and colleges. The traders were given this instruction that they would not put up boards in Hindi or in English language. They would have to put up in Punjabi language. So this was a terrifying condition when I joined. And people used to come on a motorbike and someone will be driving the motorcycle, another person will be sitting on the pillion of the motorcycle, which is the back seat. And they would come to a busy locality. The person who is sitting in the back, he would cover himself with a shawl and they would come to a busy locality, he would take out the shawl from an, and underneath the shawl there will be an AK-47 gun and they would start spraying bullets on the people, killing people, they would run away. This was the situation in Chandigarh. So, we had to impose section 144, which banned pillion riding. So, we, we imposed a condition that nobody can sit on the back of the two-wheeler because if there is only one person who is driving the motorcycle, he cannot perform both the acts driving as well as carrying an AK-47 gun. So we banned that. Whenever we spotted someone who was sitting on the pillion, he was immediately arrested. A coercive measure, definitely controlling the life and liberty of people, but that was a utilitarian principle, and the big, biggest, greatest good of the greatest number. In 1990, while I was the district magistrate, one of the prime ministers of this country uh, he brought about, a, he took a decision, uh, he implemented the recommendations of a commission and uh, I'm sure all of you, which, which brought young people, boys and girls onto the roads. Uh, so Mandal Commission uh, was that commission, which provided for a reservation for uh, OBCs and uh, people who belong to the general category, they came on the streets and they said that this has been implemented in a great hurry and it has uh, reduced our chances of entry into the government service by another 27% or so. Now, whether that was right or wrong, I'm not going to debate on that. It's a highly uh, emotive social uh, issue, but I'm going to talk about it as a challenge which uh, was faced before us. So the young boys and girls, they came on the street and they started uh, vandalizing. Uh, the property was destroyed. They used to move in processions, uh, shouting slogans against the Prime Minister and the central government. And uh, a ding-dong battle with the administration went on. And then something more happened, that something happened in Delhi, so uh, which actually precipitated the issue further. Uh, what happened? Yeah. 
So emulation took place. Atma Daha. One boy in Delhi, his name was Rajiv Goswami. He decided to douse himself with petrol and kerosene and set himself on fire. And he was burning like a human torch when he was shifted to the hospital. And by the end of the day, even though social media was not there or even the, the, the mobiles were not there, but this news spread like wildfire all over the country. And in, in sympathy for that boy, girls and boys, in those emotive moments, they went back to their houses, locked themselves inside their rooms, doused themselves with petrol and kerosene and set themselves on fire. And they were burning. And when uh, the entire country, the boys and girls were burning, and their parents were very agitated and angry, and they felt that this recommendation should have been withdrawn. Now, what happened was I had to face four challenges in Chandigarh. And uh, the four challenges that, number one was, the first challenge which was required to provide the best medication to that boy or the girl. And therefore, we used to shift the her or uh, him to the PGI. PGI is the best hospital in Chandigarh. We used to shift him or her, provide the best possible medication in the intensive care unit ICU. The second challenge was that whenever this happened, people downed their shutters. The shops were closed. They came on the street and they used to enter into a law and order situation. We had to deploy a lot of magistrate and police force to control that law and order situation because their anger against the prime minister was very high. The third challenge was that if the burn injuries were more than 50%, then the chances of survival are very remote. burn injuries. And then the boy or the girl used to die. And you know that the administration always wants that the cremation should be done as quickly as possible. Because as long as the mortal remains of that person are there in front of the eyes of the relatives, there will be huge amount of emotion and sensitivity, feelings. And therefore, administration as collector of Chandigarh, I wanted that the cremation should be done as quickly as possible. But you know, cremation stop after a certain hour of the day. They do not take place after a certain hour of the day. What is that time? After, uh, okay, uh, not spell, after sunset. So, which may be 6 or 5.30. The moment sun is down, the cremation stop. You cannot uh, uh, cremate the body. And uh, so the body or the mortal remains had to be kept in the mortuary for the last, for the night. And next day, the cremation could be done. And during the night, there will be a lot of emotions, you know, playing, aggravating the law and order situation. And the fourth challenge was, sometime the death started taking place on a holiday. You never know when the death will take place. There are 1.5 lakh houses in Chandigarh, where the next emulation is going to take place, you do not know. So therefore, if the death happened on a holiday, on the holiday all the shops are closed. You could not get that material which is required for cremating that body. And you know what is that material? Ek matka hota hai. Mitti ka matka leke maa phola jata hai. Til ke laddu hote hai. There are many such things. Maha, Maha Brahman carries it out. So that was not available because the shops were closed. So you will be shocked to know that uh, we had to purchase that thing in advance and keep it in my collector's office because I wasn't very sure when the next emulation is going to take place and whether we will be able to save that boy or the girl because ultimately we can only do the medication but the, uh, everything is in the hand of the Almighty. So, uh, so if it happened on a holiday, then we used to hand over that material to the parents, the grieving parents, and we used to say, please carry out the last rites. One day, one very prominent, promising girl of Chandigarh, she decided to emulate. And while she was being rushed in a car, even in that precarious situation, she started shouting slogans against the central government. And people heard her cries and the moment they heard her cries, they came out of their shops and houses, they downed their shutters, got into their cars and followed this car to the PGI. It was about 5 o'clock in the evening. It was getting dark. And by the time the girl was wheeled into the PGI, laid on the 
bed of the ICU, 20,000 people assembled outside the PGI in great anger. They wanted to gain entry into the PGI, destroy the place, burn down the place, probably affect the lives of other patients also because so much was anger was there. So the girl was placed on the, on the bed of the ICU. There was a glass door. Outside the parents were standing and they could see the girl inside lying on the bed. The girl was immediately put on ventilator. When the ventilator started functioning, the chest of the girl started going up, down, up, down, up, down. She started breathing. So the parents were satisfied, at least the girl is alive. But how long? I was just thinking what will happen in case by any chance, God forbid, the girl passes away. We were trying to best give the best treatment, but she had more than 50% burns. Seven o'clock, the girl died. And now I had to face 20,000 people outside. And if I announced the death of the girl, they would come charging in inside because she was a very popular girl of Chandigarh. And when they will enter, we will have to use force because I, it is my duty as a collector to maintain law and order. And maybe I will have to order firing, maybe order lati charge or tear gas shells. In all cases, there will be injuries. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to unnecessarily injure those people. I wanted to find another way out. And there the issue came regarding ethics. So the first option was to declare the death of the girl and face the consequences which was perfectly legal. There was nothing wrong with that. Under criminal procedure code, it is the duty of the district magistrate to use the minimum force to control an unlawful assembly. Second option was to tell the parents of the girl that your daughter has passed away. But please don't cry. Because if you cry, people will come to know about it. And they will enter the PGI. And we will have a first class law and order problem. That was a very inhuman thing to do. Telling the parents of the girl whose daughter has passed away was something which I didn't want to do that. But I had one more way. I had one more option. And that was the most apt option at that point of time. I knew it was getting dark. And people will not stay for very long. So I wanted to buy time. So what we did at that point of time, in consultation with all stakeholders. Stakeholder means in the government. We did not declare the death of the girl. How did we do that? You have to give a clear impression that the girl is alive. How did we do that? The ventilator kept on operating. The chest of the girl went up, down, up, down, up, down. The soul had gone. She was lay dead on the bed, but they gave the impression that the girl is alive. We went on with the ventilator for five hours. One o'clock early in the morning, by that time everyone had gone away. And then we declared the death of the girl. Then the mortal remains were kept in the mortuary. And next day we carried out the last rites. So here, by not disclosing the whole truth, may appear to be, on one hand, unethical. But it was ethical, because I was able to save the lives of those people who were standing outside, without any firing, without any lati charge. So sometimes, as I told you, ethics is contextual. It depends on the situation and the need of the hour. So sometimes, in the larger interest of the people, if you carry out certain things, which may normally be decided, regarded as unethical will ultimately be ethical. So this is only one such example which I can give. There were at least two to three dozen examples and that is why I exhort all of you that be a part of the civil service. You will never be able to get the kind of experience which you will have in the civil service. Unimaginable experiences as collector, as, law, as district magistrate, as a deputy commissioner, as returning officer, everywhere. It's a new thing. Every day it will be a new experience. So, uh, so uh, let's come to the last topic of the day. So, uh, artificial intelligence ethics. 
again an issue which we have sort of also discussed in some way and the artificial intelligence has become a, a talked about world nowadays uh, with the invent advent of uh, chat gpt <laughs> so chat gpt has is one great tool in the hands of everyone it is going to result in many uh, people losing their jobs also so uh, ai ethics uh, ai ethics in technological advancements can help foster a world with less bias and more fairness so if the ethics are exercised in artificial intelligence it will because technological advancement will keep on taking place it will help foster a world with less bias and more fairness because artificial intelligence is something which uh, is beyond humans in a way and therefore it is going to throw up many challenges so here is artificial intelligence as ai becomes increasingly important to society experts in this particular field have identified a need for ethical boundaries uh, when it comes to creating and implementing new ai tools although there is currently no widespread governing body but many countries in the world uh, they have got together and uh, some ngos are also working on coming out with some kind of a self discipline in the ai so ai ethics are the moral principle that companies use to guide responsibly and fair development so as i said any new thing which you uh, which comes across can only be done uh, regulated by either a law or with the help of self regulating mechanism and people where you do not have sufficient maturity uh, in the democracy or in, in the, any form of government you need to have regulation because ultimate aim you know every government the ultimate aim what the citizen want what do the citizen want as the most important thing security peace harmony so yes so anything that disturbs that so that is the uppermost thing development wagera baad mein bhi ho sakta hai but first thing is security of the family you need your family to be secure peace so therefore anything which disturbs that peace and artificial intelligence or social media or any many such thing like the prime minister talked about recently the deep fakes at a number of occasions because that has the the capability or capacity to unnecessarily put uh, misimpressions in the minds of the people and thereby agitating certain group of people to come out against some other people also so artificial intelligence again is a double edged tool so what are ai ethics ai ethics are the set of guiding principle that stakeholders from engineers to government used to ensure artificial intelligence technology is developed and used responsibly responsibly means on the basis of values because value is something which makes us responsible and you know there is always please remember one thing that in when you will become a civil servant you will earn two things one is called authority the other is called power authority comes from the chair on which you are sitting as long as you are sitting on that chair authority will be there the moment the chair is pulled from underneath the authority goes but the power is the permanent thing power is the sum total of two things the values and the skills you will earn many skills in 35 years of service that skill will remain with you even after retirement people will respect you because of those skills and will respect you because of the values which you profess those people who do not have value system or skills they are neglected in the society after uh, retirement nobody respects these people but these people who have got power they are respected all over the time and always remember that once you will become the civil servant your aim should be to become significant people successful people is not important there are two types of people in this world significant people and successful people successful people are those 
who take much more from the organization and the society but give back much less to the society but significant people are those which take much less from the society but give back much more to the society homi jahangir baba vikram sarabhai swami vivekanand cv raman apj abdul kalam shri dharan ratan tata they have given much more to the society so don't hanker after success success will come automatically if you are significant people who are significant even when they leave this world people remember them so therefore the aim should be clear as a civil servant become significant and another thing practice humility and if a person is having humility he or she will become very popular after 2 years you will be transferred out from a place those people who have worked hard they are humble they are remembered for all times to come and those people who are believe in show off or arrogance who who want to be always seen on the media social media or the newspapers they are easily forgotten because people scorn them nobody likes a civil servant to unnecessarily hog the headlines neither the senior officers nor the politicians and therefore your aim should be simple to remain within the confines of the conduct rules if you go out of it sooner or later maybe even problem and uh, people have fallen into trouble gone into trouble i would not name some officers who have become very who were very fond of publicity every day they wanted their name to be in the newspaper ultimately what happened they lost the sympathy of every political party because every political party felt here is a civil servant who is more bothered about himself rather than bothering about the aims of which the public you know the good with the welfare of the public so okay so these are the guiding principles to uh, control or ensure artificial intelligence is used responsibly this means taking a safe secure humane and environmentally friendly approach to the ai so a strong ai code of ethics can include avoiding bias so bias is impartiality not having any particular bias ensuring privacy of users and their data privacy of the data and mitigating environmental risk codes of ethics in companies and government led regulatory frameworks are two main ways so that's one is the code of ethics the other is the law yahi tarike hain inko regulate karne ke and therefore you have to have a combination of both the companies must have a code of ethics and the government must ensure regulation so by covering global and national ethical ai issues and laying the policy framework is in companies both regulate ai technology okay so more broadly discussion around ai ethics has progressed from being centered around academic research and ngos so today big tech companies like ibm google and meta have assembled teams to tackle ethical issues that arise from collecting massive amounts of data when you go to a departmental store even you go to the chaios or cafe coffee day they ask for your mobile number why you know what happens they sell the mobile numbers they sell it to different companies because all your details are there and then you start getting calls from policybazaar.com or from hdfc or from any other basically this is exactly the misuse of the data big data which is being collected and artificial intelligence is again an area where it is liable to be misused considerably so government and inter government have begun now device regulations so stakeholders kon kon se hain let us see the stakeholders they play a very important part number one academics academics researchers professors are responsible for developing theory based statistics research and ideas that can support government corporations and non profit organization so academics the universities the institutes national institutes of repute they are one stakeholders which formulate the theory second is the government agencies and committees within the government can help facilitate ai ethics in a nation so that is why i said that it is ultimately the think tank the 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 groups the committees which have to constantly update what is happening in, around us 
to bring out new legislation on the part of the government as you were mentioning that consumer protection act they brought about an amendment but then over a period of time it uh, required changes so therefore government plays a very very important part and there was a national science and technology council in 2016 which outlines ai and its relationship to public outreach regulation governance economy and security so that is the second stakeholder that is uh, the government i will give all the uh, these ppts to you so you don't have to worry uh, i will i will give pass on everything to you the 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 knowledge is universal it does not belong to any particular person it belongs to the universe so therefore whatever i have got i will be happy to uh, part with that knowledge to you, all of you the third is intergovernment entities so entities like united nations and the world bank are responsible for raising awareness and drafting agreements for ai ethics globally for example unesco's 193 member states adopted the first ever global agreement on the ethics of ai in november 2021 to promote human rights and dignity so they said that in ai care must be taken to protect the human rights and dignity then of course non profit organizations so non profit organizations like black in artificial intelligence and queer in artificial intelligence help diverse groups gain representation within ai technology and the future of life institute created 23 guidelines so these are different ngos non profit organizations which also are working and uh, these organizations are very powerful uh, uh, in in the western countries even uh, uh, i don't know any one of you has studied the public policy if those of you who have not studied it's a very interesting topic because yesterday i was saying that why civil service civil service you want to enter uh, i don't know some of you might be not yeah so public policy cycle the civil servant goes through all the six steps of public policy cycle no other occupation no other job gives you an opportunity to be a part where you are form identifying the problem problem of farmers problem of uh, landless people you are identifying the problem finding options solutions formulating a policy implementing the policy making it into a law then evaluation the policy so this is the policy cycle so public policy is something which you will be part of and different stages of life as collector you will be doing implementation as secretary you will be formulating the policies so this is how you will get the exposure to something which is unimaginable mind boggling in a civil service okay so then private companies so executives at google meta and other tech companies and banking consultants health care and other industries also use ai technology they are responsible for ethical teams and codes of conduct so they are all uh, doing it because they know that uh, ai uh, is the future and uh, after chat gpt google google was left behind so they are eh ha jamni launch google correct and but then bard is also coming yeah yeah so why are ai ethics important ai ethics are important because ai technology is meant to augment or replace human intelligence ai will either augment or replace human intelligence but when technology is designed to replicate human life the same issues that can cloud human judgment can seep into the technology so issues like machine learning big data you know machines have started behaving like human beings which is uh, something which is one has to take notice of that particular thing so ai projects built on biased or inaccurate data can have harmful consequences particularly for unrepresented or marginalized groups or individuals so further if ai algorithms and machine learning models are built too hastily then it can become unmanageable for engineers and product managers to correct learned biases so there can be biases what kind of biases can be there hmm non 
yes non inclusion yes value based bias yes absolutely correct value based bias there can be gender biases also so some there have been there who have removed the word women so they have underplayed those organization which are represented by women those are artificial intelligence who were male dominated patriarchal society they wanted to bring down the 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 gender so there can be many types of biases it can be regarding marginalized people or scheduled caste or scheduled tribe or handicapped people everything kind of thing can be done so ai ethics in films and tv also i don't know whether any one of you um, saw a film called her where a computer user falls in love with his operating system because of the husky voice so this kind of uh, thing also has been happening by the way can you tell me what is pygmalion effect what is pygmalion effect have you ever heard about it it's a very important term which we use in administration also what is pygmalion effect hmm okay so pygmalion effect is like that there was an artist sculptor sculptor was <laughs> yes he was creating a woman and the woman was so beautiful he fell in love with that woman and the the love was so intense that the woman came to light she became real now that principle is called pygmalion effect which says that if you has greater expectation from your subordinates then your subordinate will start performing better so if you have a much greater expectation from your subordinate he or she will perform even better because he or she will realize that you have got a greater expectation from her so his performance or her performance will improve that is pygmalion effect okay so examples of ai ethics it may be easiest to illustrate the ethics of ai with real life example so there was an app called lensa so lensa used artificial intelligence to generate cool cartoon looking profile photos from people's regular images and from an ethical standpoint some people criticized the app for not giving credit or enough money to artists who credited the original digital art so the ai was uh, you know they they used ai and they took away all the credit so according to washington post lensa was being trained on billions of photographs sourced from it the internet without consent so that was an unethical activity uh, which was used by lensa another example is uh, chat gpt so which enables users to interact with it by asking questions chat gpt uh, is also there was something started off in apple also what was that siri so siri was started and uh, so chat gpt scores the internet for data and answers with a poem python code or a proposal even a draft an email everything beautifully written and uh, that will put many people who are expert in that area like content writer or translators they will go out of jobs so that is the unethical part you see so uh, and uh, people who are using chat gpt they will project themselves much better as compared to many intelligent people who don't have are who are more honest they are not using the chat gpt uh, ai so it that again is an ethical issue so uh, so with so therefore winning contests would become easier for those who uh, who use chat gpt hmm? so these are just two popular examples as ai has grown in recent years influencing nearly every industry so the topic has become very very uh, more salient and how do we ensure bias free artificial intelligence what can be done about it so there are many potential solutions uh, but the stakeholders have to work very responsibly in ensuring that so ethical challenges there are many ethical challenges of uh, ai what are they ai and bias so the bias is if you see in 2018 amazon was under fire 
for its AI recruiting tool that downgraded resumes that featured women, such as Women's International Business Society. So, jitne bhi resumes women ke the, it undermined that, and that was a bias which was on account of the AI tool introduced by Amazon. So, even the big companies they have been they are subject to this particular bias and this caused legal risk for the technology giant ai and privacy that of course is a is a very important thing lensa for example ai relies on data pulled from internet searches social media photos and comments online even facebook was uh, charged uh, with this uh, data that uh, they are they are compromising the privacy of the data of the various people anything which is activity which is done on google or facebook it is recorded everything they are listening watch always you see and while this helps to personalize the customer experience there are questions around the apparent lack of true consent so the consent of those people who are the stakeholders they are never taken and their data is utilized ai and the environment so some ai models are large and require significant amount of energy which have an impact on the environment so that is why people say that if you want to save environment you become vegetarian why yeah reduce poultry requirement all these things the meat etc has to be put in cold storages number 1 it requires lot of energy and for feeding them you, you require lot of food grains lot of uh, land so therefore the requirements of energy become much more and that is how the environment with greater energy requirements it becomes more degradable so uh, so therefore uh, one has to devise methods and researches are going on to incorporate environmental ethical concerns into and ai related policies uh, the environment has also getting affected because of uh, materialism uh, we are becoming too materialistic isn't it uh, if we can do with two pants and two shirts but we will like to purchase a dozen pants and a dozen shirts to put, you know fill up our wardrobe now all these things require energy you require water you require power in order to make a shirt or a pant and uh, therefore uh, people say that one should uh, try to get rid of this materialism and uh, that is uh, because if we try to show off everyone likes to show off ki dekho mere paas itne sare pants hain itne badhiya mane sweaters hain so therefore people say that one should move from egology to ecology egology e g o is ego so egology to ecology so by getting rid of that ego becoming less materialistic so ultimately it is the environment which is going to play a very very important part so how to create more ethical ai well creating more ethical ai requires a close look of the ethical implications of policy education and technology and regulatory frameworks can ensure that technologies benefit societies rather than harm it so globally governments are beginning to enforce policies for ethical ai including how companies should deal with legal issues so that was about ai so any questions on ai if you have uh, we can yeah go ahead <laughs> no problem uh, first of all thank you so much for taking all the question from my side Uh, the question is around. For on one hand, we are talking about ecology to ecology, yeah. and on sec second hand, we talk about the economic growth yeah. and uh, other things yeah. around that. Yeah. So, uh, how far? We, if this is a question from my interview panel uh, to me, because I am not comprehend my answer till now about this. This is why I am taking suggestion from you. How far we can justify economic growth versus environmental growth as a vis-a-vis -vis ecology? Because three of these concepts are not synced with each, each other. When we are talking about eco ecology, and at the same time, on the second answer, we talk about economic growth, and in third answer, we talk about ecology. Yeah. 
So, uh, absolutely right. Uh, I, I would only uh, like to suggest uh, one environmentalist. His name, her name was Mathai. If you find time, she was a Nobel laureate, and she said development must take place, but at the not at the cost of environment, and a, an environment sustainability is a must. That development which eats into the environmental sustainability should not take place. And the beautiful idea she has given, uh, Mathai. So uh, my view is number one, ecology is out of question. We should shed ego. Can you tell me what is the full form of ego? E-G-O. What is the full form of ego? Ego. E-G-O. It is enveloping goodness over. The goodness which is present in every one of us, when it gets enveloped, it remains inside, it does not come out, then you are in a state of ego. And therefore, sometimes we have the values inside, but we do not use those values vis-a-vis -vis dealing with other human beings in the society because of the I factor, that is the ego. So let ego go away, the goodness should come out. And you know that there is that the when we talk about and as a civil servant, again I would say, preach. Don't think that I'm trying to preach. I'm not at all trying to preach, but I'm only trying to very humbly submit to you that don't believe in I. I is only thinking about yourself. Think about every other stakeholder. That is V W E. And there is a word in English which starts with the letter I. That is illness, bimari. Change I to V. And illness becomes wellness. So that is what happens if you start thinking about, as a civil servant, you have to have a bigger purpose. Remember, leader has to have a bigger purpose. Your bigger purpose is to think about your stakeholders. And that is why civil service is not a job, it is a service. You have to understand that it is unlike any other job in a corporate sector. It is actually a service, service to the humanity, service to the citizens of this world. I don't know whether any one of you have uh, read the poem called Abu Ben Adam, written by Leigh Hunt. Has any one of you read that poem? Abu Ben Adam, very small poem, Abu Ben Adam, written by Leigh Hunt, one of the famous English poets. And you know what he said? There was a very noble public servant, civil servant, by the name of Abu Ben Adam. He used to help everyone throughout the 24 hours a day he would be at the beck and call of every citizen of the society, every stakeholder. And one day he was very tired and he was lying on his bed and it was about midnight. The moonlight was coming from the window inside the room. And inside that room, he suddenly got up at about 2 o'clock in the morning and he found that there was an angel sitting on a chair beside his bed. He was wearing white robe and he was writing in a book of gold. So he said, who is this gentleman? Ye Dev Purush kaun hai? Jo mere kamre mein aake achanak baithe hai. Toh nuna ka, hey Dev Purush, aap kya likh rahe hai? So the angel raised his head and he said, I'm writing the names of those people who love God. So Abu Ben Adam said, is my name there in that list? List of those people who love God? He looked up at the list and he said, I'm sorry, your name is not there. He was disappointed, Abu Ben Adam, but still cheerfully he said, even if my name is not there in that list, would you kindly write my name in another list? A list of those people who love the fellow men, the countrymen, the citizen, the stakeholder of this country, because I try to be helpful to them. He wrote and disappeared. Next day he again came and he showed the final list of those people whose love God had blessed. And lo and behold, Abu Ben Adam's name was at number one. So those people who love the fellow men, countrymen, citizens of this country, which you will get an opportunity, no other citizen would get that opportunity. You will be in a position to come very near to God. Because a public servant is someone who is able to help others. I remember when I was the collector of Chandigarh, so the local member of parliament, his name was Jagannath Kaushal, and he came to my office first day, taking over charge. And he said, DC Sahab, you know, that is the collector is called Deputy Commissioner. He said, DC Sahab, I'm going to a place called Mani Majra. Why don't you accompany me? It will give you an opportunity to meet the, the people of this area. 
So I accompanied him. And there on the dais, both of us were sitting. And he got up and he said, Bhai or Behno, you are a new collector, a new deputy commissioner. Hai. And then he turned towards me and very politely he said, DC Sahab, you are a public servant. And by virtue of being a public servant, you have got power in the pen. Aapki kalam mein taakat hai. और उस कलम की ताकत का इस्तेमाल करके आप लोगों का भला कर सकते हैं और जब आप लोगों को का भला करेंगे तो लोग आपको दुआ देंगे और वो दुआ आपको बिल्कुल मुफ्त मिलेगी उसके लिए आपको पैसे नहीं खर्चने पड़ेंगे बल्कि उल्टा सरकार आपको सैलरी भी देगी उस दुआ को लेने के लिए सो इट्स ए विन विन सिचुएशन ही सर आपके लिए पब्लिक सर्वेंट के हाथ में कलम में ताकत है वो लोगों का भला कर सकता है और लोगों का भला करने पर लोग उसको दुआ देते हैं मुफ्त मिलती है बल्कि सरकार सैलरी देती आई नेवर फॉर गॉट दैट एंड वेन एवर देर वॉज सिंपलेस्ट ऑफ अपॉर्चुनिटी वेन एवर देर वॉज सम वन हु केम टू हेल्प आस्क फॉर हेल्प वी डिट हेल्प सो दैट इज द इज द अल्टीमेट एम ऑफ द सिविल सर्विस द प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑल्सो सेज वेरी क्लियरली इन इज वर्ड्स वेन ही सेज ऑन द सिविल सर्विसेज डे ही सेज ही सेज वेन यू डिस्पोज ऑफ द फाइल You know, all of us will be dealing with files. All of you will be dealing with file, taking decisions on the file. If you rearrange the letters of the word file, what does it become? Life. Behind every file, there is a life of a citizen of this country. And therefore, whenever you take decisions, keep in mind that the life of a citizen is getting affected by that decision you are taking on the file. And then you will immediately be immediately reminded. that you have to do a lot of good to the people of this country so that is the spirit in which uh, the the civil servant or the public servant uh, works so so the question uh, egology and ecology and uh, uh, economy uh, my view is that uh, egology is definitely out of question we should try to lead a very simple life and that is why i said a public servant should be an ideal role model for others for the people of his his or her area and uh, project to the people that this is what a civil servant should be never fond of publicity be humble lot of humane and uh, that is why i said that the values which are required to be possessed by the civil servants should be as much as possible try to practice those values coming to the economy yes economy is necessary economic development progress gdp all are important but there is a country adjoining our country which believes that the progress of a country is not determined by the gdp but by the gnh which is gross national happiness so ultimately it is the happiness of the people which is more material as compared to the economic development i i am not at all disputing the fact that the strength of a country comes from the gdp but at not at the cost of the happiness of the people if there is environmental degradation it will definitely be at the expense of the happiness of the people so i think uh, economy development environment they have to go hand in hand together the number one is environment number two would be development or the economy because ultimately if you have to survive in this world nature does not require human beings but human beings do require nature they otherwise we will not survive so that was uh, what i wanted if there are any further question you can ask me or uh, i will end up with another interesting anecdote uh, of uh, how i faced a very very uh, dangerous situation while i was the collector of chandigarh and i was telling you that uh, there was lot of terrorism in chandigarh there was one bjp uh, prominent leader his name was hita bhilashi and uh, he was under constant threat by the people so he was given lot of security by the police at the residence in the form of police static guard and one personal security officer always accompanied him and uh, terrorist came he used to reside in a particular sector of chandigarh he possessed an omni car maruti omni car he used to sit in the front of the omni car beside the driver and the pso used to sit on the back seat one day and you know the terrorist strike when the car is moving slowly jis samay car ki speed kam hoti hai terrorists us samay strike karte hain kyunki aim lena aasan hota hai that is why the prime minister and the president's car cavalcade moves very fast so that no one can take aim so people the terrorist attack when the car is stopping at a traffic signal or when you are about to approach your house car slows down or you are about to come out of the house speed is very slow so one day he was coming out of his house and two terrorists came and point blank shot bullets into him and he collapsed in his seat and he died on the spot and the entire chandigarh was up in flames 
the bjp people and the akhil bharti vidyarthi parishad people they came took to the violence and they started uh, moving about the city creating hallabulla because they are a very prominent citizen had died great bjp leader the hitabelashi that leader who was slain he had almost the same standing as that of uh, former prime minister atal bihari vajpayee and the present uh, mr lal krishna advani and balram ji das tandon almost uh, contemporary so he was a very very loved leader so uh, what happened was that uh, so i called these uh, people and i said that uh, may peace has to be maintained at all costs so what exactly uh, would you want because i wanted to settle that thing because uh, use of force was out of question because if i had used the force it would have a ripple effect all over the country it will spread to different parts of the country i wanted to uh, bring it down completely quell so therefore they said that we want to move about the city holding processions meetings so i gave permission for all of them but at the same time i took the precaution of always using police force along with them at a distance because they were very angry with the police because they felt that police was responsible for the killing of that leader and they felt that the police was at fault so police was at a distance so the next day the cremation was to be done and the top leaders from delhi they were to come to attend that cremation so the governor of punjab his name was uh, siddha shankar ray and uh, he was from congress but uh, he said that i am a governor i don't belong to any particular party i would like to attend the cremation and lay wreath on the mortal remains of hitabhilashi i will go to the cremation ground so the police said sir please don't go there the situation is very volatile and if something goes amiss then you are the vvip we will we require to protect you and therefore if even if we have to force use force we will have to protect you that may unnecessarily result into a much unsavory situation which will have recoil effect all over the country why do you have to go you remain in the raj bhavan someone else can be deputed on your behalf so he pointed he said uh, krishmohan will go there i was the collector so the police said uh, fine he can go there but we will not accompany him because their anger is against police the same situation may emerge he will have to go alone it was a very risky situation because there was so much of anger so i decided to go along with my magistrate i took one magistrate along and both of us started walking towards the cremation ground and suddenly my gunman my personal security officer his name was dharmpal he was head constable he came running to me and he said sir i am your shadow i have to protect you you cannot go alone i will have to go along with you so i said okay if you want to come along you come along and we went inside and i could smell it in the air the kind of anger which was there against the administration there were glaring eyes of the people belonged to bjp and akhil bharti vidyarthi parishad understandably because their very prominent leader had been killed so i went to the pyre and laid the wreath on the pyre and came back and sat on the dari which was lying there matam pursi karte hai na wahan par so all these prominent bjp leaders were sitting there and they started talking to me and uh, i was nodding my head i said yes i agree i apologize on behalf of the administration it should not have been done a very prominent leader we should have been able to prevent this thing from happening and suddenly my magistrate came from behind and he nudged me he pulled me by my arm and he said sir please get up i said kya ho gaya hai umed his name was umed i said umed kya ho gaya he said sir get up please get up you will not stay here even for a single minute just get up i said but it is very impolite to get up i am talking to these people and it will be very very bad he said sir you will not sit here he pulled me to the side and as i staggered nearly staggered i suddenly saw there were 15 or 20 young boys they were holding a can of kerosene in their hand and they were about to throw that kerosene onto me and set me on fire this magistrate was new to the administration nobody recognized him none of those people recognized that he was a magistrate he was leaning against a wall and he was listening to these young people talking ki aaj collector koi jala dalte hain isi bahane hamara 
रिवेंज मिल जाएगा हमको हितबलाशी के मरने से एंड ही केम रनिंग टू मी लिसनिंग की दिस कलेक्टर इज गोइंग टू डाई एंड ही पुल मी टू द साइड एंड वेन आई केम टू द साइड दीज बॉयज दे दे ran towards me with that kerosene can in my in their hands and my gunman came in between and he pointed his ak47 gun towards those people and he said one step further and i am going to burn you alive jitni magazine hai main puri khali kar dunga i will not whatever consequences but the dm will not be come to harm and then those people came back and then the police people then came from outside the dysp came they made a circle in the which i was i came along with them to the side i did not register any criminal case against those people because i wanted to end this thing forever next day the prominent bjp people came to my office and they apologized they said sir we are very sorry but please galti maaf kar dijiye i could have easily registered a criminal case 307 to banta hi tha but i did not do that i wanted to end this problem and that day after that i never had any problem talking to the local party leaders they were very very helpful they were very accommodative because they were embarrassed on that day so many time you have to be aggressive many time you have to take back seat and that is the art of administration an opportunity which all of you will have once you join civil service so so the important values which a civil servant must possess number one of course without saying uh, it uh, you know that honesty and integrity are very important number three is compassion compassion for the weaker sections of the society the women the scheduled caste the scheduled tribe so inclusivity number three is compassion number fourth is leadership you see civil servant at a very young age he or she occupies very important leadership positions which an ordinary officer would not get before 45 years of age in 25 years of age you will become the collector you will become the director they will become the managing director of a corporation which an ordinarily in a corporate world it would require 45 50 years so the leadership is the next thing then team building team building is again something because you cannot get everything done by yourself you have to build a team and then discipline and due diligence these are again two things and lastly but not the least accountability taking responsibility defending your subordinates actions you have to defend them to the hilt and never blame others not blaming circumstances so that is something and i don't uh, uh, I need to talk about transparency all the civil servants live in glass houses whatever happens everyone knows about it why because your pa your stenographer your driver your peon your gardener your reader they know everything that you do whom you meet what you take what you do so therefore always keep in mind that you have to have transparency in your actions so these are some of the values which we need to progress eh courage okay so leadership when we talk about leadership one of the important ingredients of a leader is that a leader must have courage so uh, i told you that integrity authenticity uh, uh, having a bigger purpose so one more thing which is important you have rightly said it's the courage but that itself uh, is subsumed in the leadership qualities yes yes sir in the interview <coughs> if we uh, come across a question like uh, if your seniors are pressuring you or a question along that side that if you're fa facing pressure how will you uh, oh. handle it so sir how do you uh, actually deal with such situations where you are getting orders which you don't personally agree with but you still have to follow it so sir yeah. how do you so uh, supposing uh, the senior is wanting to give you orders which are illegal in nature supposing he or she is giving orders on file illegal orders now the rule is that the rule provides that 
you get two opportunities to express your views on the file two opportunities one when the file is going up so when the file is going up supposing you are submitting a proposal to the senior officer okay supposing you are submitting a proposal you give three options all of them are legal ethical correct but supposing your superior does not agree with any of these three options he or she passes a totally illegal order and the file comes to you for implementation now what will you do it is your superior who has given you an illegal order but it is in writing and he is your superior what will you do it's an illegal order but in writing ha huh. so so therefore this is what exactly what i was wanting to say which you have just now said law gives you two opportunities to express your views on the file one when the file was going up when you expressed you gave three options now the file has come back to you with an illegal order now you have got a second opportunity to express your views on the file so you will not implement an illegal order you will resubmit that file with observation that with all due respect to my superior the order passed by you are illegal because of the following reason and you give the reason 1 2 3 4 5 attach the necessary acts rules bylaws sops and send the file up now the superior officer will be in a quandary you have submitted that these are illegal orders if he implements again the illegal order the entire responsibility will be his whereas if you had implemented that wrong order in the first place the responsibility will be divided between you and him so therefore never implement an illegal order bring to the notice of the superior person that these are illegal orders because of the following reasons on file supposing he gives a verbal order then it is always there are two ways i used to do that if my minister used to give me an illegal order i would go to the chief minister and the chief minister will come to my rescue so there is always a checks and balance many time my my minister was he was very angry and he used to give me all illegal orders he was very fond of money so uh, sometimes the orders had financial implications and uh, i used to oppose that so uh, how to oppose that the only way was to meet someone who can who is sitting on him and that was the chief minister so if some officer is trying to give you an illegal order go to the next officer and tell him or her ki sir this order has been given unfortunately that's a wrong order or another way is you go to the meet that officer one to one plain talk saying that uh, sir uh, these orders which you have given will have these implications tomorrow there can be an inquiry and unnecessarily all of us will get embroiled in the inquiry why do that or it will go to the press the media will grab it so in all probability he or she will understand if they do not understand then you can always carry that file or go to the next officer and say ki sir ye order pass hua hai ab aap jante hain ki ye galat order hai so why don't you call for the file so this is how we used to do that and indian administrative service provides lot of protection and cushion to those officers who remain on the right side of the law you can always bring it on file and never fear jyada jyada kya hoga you will get transfer that's all nothing more will happen a ticket it's better to face transfer rather than passing an illegal order and face the consequences so such ups and downs will come life is not hunky dory it's not always straight there are sine curve is there there are crests and there are troughs तो अच्छे भी समय आएंगे कुछ वैसे भी समय आएंगे तो बजाय इसके कि लॉन्ग टर्म में परमानेंट सेटबैक हो जाए उससे अच्छा है टेम्प्रेरी सेटबैक आई एम नॉट सेइंग कि एथिकल पीपल डोंट फेस ए प्रॉब्लम एथिकल पीपल आल्सो फेस ए प्रॉब्लम बट इन हिंदी दरी से कहावत ना सत्य परेशान होता है पराजित नहीं होता सो तो परेशान हो जाएंगे आप पराजित आप नहीं होंगे कभी भी सो देर फॉर कीप दैट इन माइंड बी ऑन द राइट साइड बिकॉज नो विल nobody will defend you agar aap if you are on the wrong side of the law na even your senior officer will leave you in the lurch you have to defend for yourself and that is possible only when you are taking ethical correct decisions 
don't be so much enamored of postings postings will come everyone will get some share of good postings some share of mediocre postings some share of ordinary postings but then that is life what is it about it is a mixture okay so i think uh, yeah so ruchi is waiting for quite some time and uh, she has been telling me that uh, that uh, all the youngsters you know they have come here and uh, she is also been keeping all of you uh, captivated you know uh, in the beginning as well as in the end and with her uh, you know capabilities of communication skills and very fine manners so thank you so much ruchi thank you sir uh, thank you so much sir for this insightful and enriching and thought provoking session uh, the discussion did not only include conventional aspects of the topic in discussion today but also having been an uh, accomplished bureaucrat yourself we could hear real life mm -hmm. experiences of your own on ground uh, as one of our students asked so you know we could hear anecdotes mm -hmm. from your own experiences um yes uh, i would like to conclude today's session with one of the quotes of uh, thomas jefferson when he said that i find that harder i work the more luck i seem to have so keep working hard the success will follow visionaries thank you uh, and wishes you all the best for your future ahead thank you good night so all the best to you for your success may god be with you and god willing all of you will come out with success in your examination the world is always very small maybe we will meet sometime when i come to the labasna for giving lectures i will meet some of you and uh, i always try to keep track of my participants many of the participants who are right now in labasna so they keep on talking to me and uh, i have been talking to them even before their announcement of result when i found that some of them who had done exceedingly well in the mock and uh, i really wanted to tell them that you can succeed but just come out of your shell one of the girls who was there who were working in drdo so i uh, uh, she was otherwise very good in the mock interview and i said uh, thought that and she had appeared twice third time she was appearing uh, she was a very defensive and uh, uh, otherwise a sweet girl but uh, um, uh, she was not coming out of herself too much so i rang her up after the mock interview and i said i would like to see you becoming an ias officer and with slight improvement in this communication skill your knowledge appears to be absolutely fine but next time i would like to see you keep that thing up motivated you will definitely be a part of the civil service so then results came out and i uh, forgot about the entire thing but then when i received a call from that girl and he said uh, she said that sir you remember Uh, you had told me that uh, i will succeed and here i am in labasna i have got 23rd rank in the all india so i was very pleased and very happy to know that and uh, i can see from the type of questions the kind of responsiveness the kind of participatory uh, you know you have shown in terms of the questions and answers that makes you all very intelligent people and i can say with confidence that all of you deserve to be a part of the civil services the best service in the country thank you so much bye bye thank you